Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I am your host, Uncivil Law, a licensed attorney in Virginia, Texas, and before the United States Supreme Court. And I hope, as always, you're just having the most fantastic day. We are here with a motion in the somehow ongoing taking care of Maya trial. You remember the taking care of trial, taking care of trial, Maya trial. Maya Kowalski is a young girl who at the age of 10 had an unclear medical diagnosis and was diagnosed with a whole bunch of things, including a very rare disorder. But she went to Johns Hopkins Hospital that didn't really believe the disorder. And they did many, many things, much of which was without any authorization whatsoever which is a problem, you know, you, you can't just do things, you know, the, 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 the doctors are like, yeah, we want to do this. And you kind of need the consent of the patient or if they're a minor or otherwise incapacitated, their guardian would be great. And Johns Hopkins is over there like, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do any of those things. And you're like, wait, what, how, how, how are you doing that? Right. Once you have the court order in place, we can talk about, you know, going beyond the scope of the court order is a whole nother thing. But the, the, like the principal issue, at least to me, it's like when you don't have a court order at all, it's like, we want to leave. No, wait, what do you mean? No, that's not an option. You have to say yes. No. And like, okay. So that was really issue. That was really bad. Now, of course I did have some issues on the legal side with the verdict, as I've t talked about before, principally, of course, as I'm sure many of you have known the issue with the intentional infliction of emotional distress, as it relates to the death of the mother, which is like a hundred million dollars worth of the damages is legally suspicious because it, it, it's a somewhat novel cause of action because there's a causality problem, right? When you're talking about negligence. You need four things for there to be negligence. Okay. You need there to be a duty. You need there to be breach of the duty. You need causation and you need damage. Okay. So first of all, you need a duty to the mother, which also, which right away raises a bit of an issue because it's not the patient. All right. But let's look past that issue. All right. Then breach of the duty. We'll, we'll concede it for the purpose of argument. The, the causation argument is where things get tricky because self-harm is normally seen as a voluntary act, normally seen as something that breaks the chain of causation. So you have a cause in fact problem, right? That caught that a didn't cause B because B is an independent cause of action. It's someone making a voluntary action. So a does not cause B. So you have a cause in fact problem. And then, of course, also you have a bit of a proximate cause ar argument as well, but that's a little bit tangential. So there is this lurking issue dealing with these things, you know, and I just want to make sure that that's clear because I've talked about this and I don't want to mislead anyone about that. But that's, of course, the law, too. But also the law, you know, the jury gets to be a jury. And if the jury is rendering a decision just because you don't like what the jury wants to do doesn't mean that you can just, you know, do whatever the hell you want. There are rules to this, man. There are rules to this. Everyone's bound by the rules. And you, you can't just you can't just disqualify the juror because you don't like their answer. And you don't like the answer they give you. That's not one of the options that's available to you. You got to do this thing in a way that makes rational, logical sense. Okay? So this motion to, to basically retroactively disqualify the juror, which you already had some issues on this, right? It's like, okay, this has got to be good, right? This has got to be jury misconduct. This is the kind of thing that they're looking for in Alex Murdoch, which I believe they should hold a hearing on, incidentally. I don't know how that hearing will turn out in the end, but I believe there is enough evidence to hold a hearing on the issue. So it's like, okay, can you point to something the juror did? Can you point to a thing or someone else did? Someone else saying I influenced the juror, maybe. Someone else confessing to something. That would be great. Could you do any of those things? No? Okay. If not, then get wrecked. All right? Get wrecked. All right? So the juror is the finder of fact. They're allowed to not like you. Also, just, just as a way of framing this from the start, I want to say this because I think that the council also forgets this and something I've had to explain before. Judgment is not the same thing as bias. Okay. Bias is when you go into it, favoring one side or another, just because you come out with a very strong opinion that does not indicate bias inherently. Lady justice has a pair of scales in her hand. If the scales are lopsided, they're lopsided. Lady justice saying the scales are lopsided is not bias. It's just 
judgment, okay? So just because they come out with a result saying, we really, really hate you, Johns Hopkins, doesn't mean they're biased. If they heard the evidence and came to a conclusion that Johns Hopkins is demon spawn, that's judgment, not bias, because they based it on what they heard in the case, and that was their assessment of the evidence and how it weighed. So I take note of that right away because the attorneys here also seem to conflate these things, right? They, they're like, oh, they really, really hate us. They, gave up, they came up with a huge verdict against us. It must be that they're biased. Maybe it's just that your case sucks ass. But you know, okay, let's, let's actually look at this thing before we get too deep into this thing. We are in the circuit court of the 12th Judicial District, Judicial Circuit for Sarasota County, Florida, the Civil Division, Jack Kowalski versus John Hopkins, defendant's motion for a new trial based on jury misconduct, motion for a jury interview, motion to up discovery into evidence of jury misconduct, and emergency motion to preserve evidence. This better be really, really good. This better be super duper good. Okay. Defendant Johns Hopkins, all children's hospital, by and through undersigned counsel and pursuant to rules, hereby moves this court for an order permitting interview of juror number one, opening discovery of evidence into juror misconduct, requiring preservation of certain evidence on an emergency basis, and granting a new trial based on misconduct on the ground set forth below. This had better be good. According to the Florida Supreme Court, potentially harmful juror misconduct, including contact with a juror during a trial about the pending matter, is presumed prejudicial. Okay. I mean, it would have to be contact with the juror about the trial because the juries, the jury, unless they are, you know, sequestered, go into the world. And even if they're sequestered, they're going to interact with somebody, probably. I mean, you know. Unless it's super duper sequestering, right? They probably interact with someone outside themselves. But so, yeah, it's not just contact with a juror during the trial. It has to be about the trial, right? Because, yeah. Uh, all right. A juror, a party seeking a juror interview does not have to conclusively establish that the alleged jury misconduct occurred and actually prejudiced the case. Fair enough. Right? You don't have to determine it conclusively, but it would be helpful if you had some actual evidence instead of just guesses and wishes and hopes. That would be nice. Rather, it is only necessary that the party establish a basis for inquiry or grounds the party believe may exist. Uh-huh. It's going to require a little bit more than that. Yeah. Once improper conduct or jury misconduct is established by a jury interview, which is definitely not going to happen, the moving party is entitled to a new trial unless the opposing party can demonstrate there is no reasonable possibility that jury misconduct affected the verdict. Okay. A new trial based on improper conduct contact may be required under some circumstances as a matter of public policy for the purpose of maintaining confidence. Sure, it's required sometimes. Not often, though, there, you know, the law has a pretty, uh, pretty, a pretty reserved uh, desire to look into the jury's machinations. This is just something we don't do as a matter of policy. So the policy is leave the jury alone and what happens happens like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But, you know, with actual legal effect. And what happens in the jury room stays in the jury room. And we do not pierce into the jury's looking unless, you know, we have really good reasons, really solid reasons. Like, for example, the jury said, yeah, I was contacted by a guy or the guy contacted them. Or we have evidence of the bribe or something would be nice, like actual evidence that actually exists in the real world. That would be helpful. The motion sets forth a reasonable basis. Does it though? Does it? Is it based on reason or is it based on wishes? Let's see. That juror number one, the foreperson, engaged in presumptively prejudicial misconduct during the course of the trial by deliberately disregarding the court's specific instructions not to discuss the case with anyone during the trial, not to consider any evidence or information outside of what was presented during the trial, and not to form any opinions about the case prior to deliberation. 
Uh-huh. The motion is supported by a sworn affidavit of Mr. Shapiro, who, oh, by the way, just as a personal note, he writes Shapiro Esquire, and I instantly don't like him more. He actually spelled out Esquire. Who does that? Who does that? Who spells it out? Damn. The affidavit and evidence discovered by defense counsel after the verdict reveals potentially harmful and therefore presumptively prejudicial jury misconduct arising out of improper communications between the juror and his wife. Now, guys, I think it's possible the juror and his wife might have had some kind of contact over the course of the trial. I'm just guessing. Collect they apparently also reside in the same household. What a strange and unusual relationship. A husband and a wife living in the same house. Wow. What bastards. What bastards. That's, that's a strange thing to do. Who does that? Who lives in a house with their wife? I mean, really. During the course of the nine-week trial, the evidence reveals a shocking level of involvement in the case. And palpable. It's palpable. We can taste it on the tip of our tongue. In favor of plaintiff on juror number one's wife, as well as social media posts sharing inside information they could only obtain from her husband. Really? Uh, uh, not, on a, not on too fine a point, but like what inside information does juror number one have? Because they're also not supposed to talk amongst themselves, remember? And also the trial is in public and also on Zoom and there's commentators about it and also the court docket. So uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but juror number one doesn't exactly have access to much, if really any, inside information. It's a public trial, in the public, in a public way, before the public, the public, mind you. Okay. Considered in totality, the evidence provides a reasonable basis for the belief that juror number one disregard his juror's oath and the court's instruction by engaging in improper juror communications and contact. He probably had contact with his wife, I'm sure. Juror number one's own post-verdict involvement on social media corroborates the belief that he engaged in improper contact and communication regarding the case and formed a shared bias in plaintiff's favor as evidenced by the verdict. Once again, judgment is not the same thing as bias. I don't like that witness. I don't believe that witness. I think that witness is spurning lies. That witness doesn't seem credible to me. I don't think that witness is telling the truth about so-and-so. Judgment is not bias. It's judgment. Please stop conflating the two. You're hurting me. <sighs> In addition to the presumptively prejudicial contact and communication between juror one and his wife, the evidence warrants a juror interview. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. And a new trial for added reason that juror one's wife involvement on social media during the course of the trial, her undisguised bias. And also, by the way, her judgment is not the same thing as bias either, by the way. And all, they think they have, a, they have similar opinions. Wow. Maybe they'd get along. And her alignment with social media influencers, closely related plaintiffs, also the social media influencer, may not be biased. They're also allowed to have an opinion. It's legal in America. Maybe they watched the trial. Maybe they don't like the witnesses. Maybe they don't believe Johns Hopkins. Maybe they think Johns Hopkins case is shit. Just because the social media influencer has an opinion doesn't mean that opinion is necessarily biased. If it's based off the things they heard at the trial, it's judgment, not bias. So the social influencer is known as Jules. Jules. Gets a shout out in this thing. Jules is famous and later is going to be called Notorious. Notorious. Oh, 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 oh. Notorious. Jules. Notorious. Yeah, I, yeah, you got your own theme song, man. It's great. All right. Defendant therefore moves for an order permitting the interview of juror number one and his wife. 
to establish the presumptively prejudicial context. Let me help you out. Juror number one and his wife are married. They had contacts of various descriptions. He probably knew his wife. Y yeah, okay. Defendant additionally moves for an order permitting discovery of information establishing the misconduct, as well as an, you want you want a fishing expedition. How about no? As well as an order requiring juror number one and his wife to preserve evidence, including text message, social media activity, and other data. On an emergency basis, it's an emergency, don't you know? Uh-huh. All right, post-trial research and information obtained regarding Mrs. Juror, Social media history reveals that her personal engagement with the public commentary of this trial is unlike that of a member of the public. Really? Okay. Who shares a general interest in the case and is particularly inappropriate given her role as a wife of a jury foreman. Why is that a particularly inappropriate thing? Uh, why is that particularly inappropriate? Why is it particularly inappropriate for the wife of the foreman to be interested in the trial? Does anyone have any clues? I don't know. Do you? Okay. The, this Mrs. Juror's social media post foreshadows questions from juror number one to witness. Uh huh. Shared information on the thought process of the jury and highlight her heavy personal bias in favor of the plaintiff. Say it with me. Bias is not the same thing as judgment and emotional involvement in a verdict in their favor. A bias apparently shared by her husband. I couldn't help noticing that many people were emotionally invested in this verdict. I was less emotionally invested in this. And people have been critical of me for that to some degree, but that's okay. We can all look at these things differently. And I look at it in an analytical way. And it's like, you know, I'm not so sure about the, the medical negligence cause of action. I'm not so sure about that, you know, intentional infliction of emotional distress leading to the death of Maya's mother. I have, I'm not sure about these amounts. These amounts here seem a little bit high for some of these things. You know, I was, I was a little critical of some of the roles. But, you know, some of you guys also emotionally invested. That's okay. We're different people. Wow. You know, different people look at it differently. Amazing. Film at 11. Who knew? Also, they say emotionally invested like emotions are inherently bad. Yeah. I mean, it is a jury of people. People are known to sometimes be emotional. Okay. Yeah. The posts give rise to a reasonable belief and concern on the part of the defendant that the jury's verdict has been tainted and defendant has been deprived of his right to a fair trial before an impartial jury. No, you haven't. Get wrecked. Work on your appeal. Work on that medical negligence thing. Work on the IIED thing. Your time would be better spent there, sir, than on whatever this is. In addition to her post, Mrs. Juror's presence at the trial further counts doubt on the integrity of the trial. It is a public courtroom. It is a public courtroom. It's open to the public in a public way. The public, they get to look at it and they attend it. Anyone can be there. She wants to go to the trial. She wants to watch. Is she not allowed in the courtroom? Did I miss a memo somewhere? I don't think so. Okay, but apparently uh, it was guided by her husband. Okay. On October 30th of 2023, Mrs. Juror physically attended the trial proceedings in which her husband was impaneled. Juror number one said nothing of her presence. Why would he? Who would he say it to? What ruled it? Was he supposed to? Prior to her appearance, Mrs. Juror sought out Jules, Hala, who was demonstrably embedded with the plants. Were you demonstrably embedded? Is that what you were doing? And served as a public advocate, if not de facto agent. Wow, you're an agent now. That's exciting. Both at trial and subsequent to the verdict. Mrs. Juror and Jules exchanged phone numbers. Wow. They might want to talk to each other. Wow. 
Jer, Jer, the Mrs. Jur and Jules are jerks, man. They want to talk to each other and stuff. Wow. What a thought. That's exciting. Yeah. No, she wasn't a juror. I just didn't know what else to call her. Uh, maybe Mrs. Juror isn't a good name. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, what else can I call her so that's not confusing? Uh, wife of juror number one, I guess. We'll call her that. On October 30th, 2023, Mrs. Wife of Juror Number One can be seen in a video footage in the courtroom for the entire day, often seated, new, seated next to and speaking with Jules. They're seated next to each other in the courtroom. They're friendly. They're talking to each other. Oh my God. Okay. I don't care whether they exchange phone numbers or not. I wouldn't care either way. So I don't know if they exchanged phone numbers. I don't know if they didn't exchange phone numbers. I can't be bothered to care either way. I just don't care. For her part, Jules became notorious. Notorious. Just call her wifey. Ooh, 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 ooh. Notorious. Jules is notorious. Why can't someone call me notorious, man? This is no good, man. Uh, for, Jules became notorious in online communities that cover the trial because not only did she physically attend the trial like a person can because it's open to the public in a public way, but also provide regular updates on social media such as TikTok and YouTube. And also I hear not so much with the YouTube because she doesn't use the YouTube. But either way, I don't care. Legally, I don't care. I don't care legally if she does use YouTube or, YouTube or not, because it just doesn't matter. It is not a fact that matters. Rakita Law, friend of the channel, Nick Rakita enters the chat. Nice to know he's alive occasionally. Look, how, Love how someone attending a public trial who is married to a juror is somehow assumed to be breaching trial confidentiality. This is obviously ridiculous. Spouses observe news about the trial constantly. Show me the breach. Nick Rakita runs the channel Rakita Law and is a personal friend of mine. So, Hala, it's nice to see you here. Yeah, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. It's like they're married. So they're obviously in a conspiracy. That's how that works, I'm sure. They, they talk to each other. They probably eat with each other. I think once they were seen holding hands. Great. It's apparent from these videos that Jules shares a close relationship with Jack and Maya Kowalski. How'd you get there? I don't know. That's like three degrees of Kevin Bacon shit right there. Um, but uh, okay. Um, making her friendship with the juror all the more appropriate. Why? Is she not allowed to be friends with Maya and Jack and this person? Why? I think the wife is allowed to be friends with an Is she not allowed to choose her own friends? Does she need? Wait a second. I'm confused. Are, are you saying that she needs the permission of her husband to have friends? Or are you saying that she only has these friends because she has her husband's permission? Maybe her husband's like, yeah, it would be okay, honey, if you are friends with her, with friends with them. Oh, okay. Yeah, it must be that, right? A wife could never have friends unless the husband gave permission. That must be what it is. The husband gave permission, told them to be an inf told them to enter the fray told them to become close confidence so they could really entrench themselves. Nick Ricada from Ricada Law says, hopefully they don't kiss. Kissing is gross. I know, I know. So it, it, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe the thing is that she could only be doing this with the express permission of her husband. She waits on him hand and foot. All that good stuff, yeah, that must be it. Or maybe she's allowed to have friends on her own exciting ten dollars from old i says strictly speaking uncivil they are in a conspiracy not just a criminal one fair but that conspiracy has been licensed by the state so you can't use it against them For example, on October the 9th of 2023, Jules, the, notor the Notorious Jules, every time her name is appears from now on, I will try to say Notorious Jules because it amuses me. The Notorious Jules posted her video on her TikTok page, saying she gave Maya Kowalski her rosary beads prior to Maya's live testimony that day. What a jerk. What a jerk. They shared a moment together and she shared rosary beads. Wow, Crazy Cat King is $2. Shapiro Esquire, did he forget his LSAT score? That must be the explanation. Nothing else makes sense. 
On November, on October the 11th, 2023, Jules called in to Recovery Addict's YouTube live stream covering the channel. Shout out to the Recovery Addict, stating that she texted with Maya over the weekend and after giving her rosary beads, asked Plants Council not to object to the jurors' questions regarding whether Maya carried a rosary because she knew Maya had the rosary beads in her pocket. Okay. Okay, and therefore what? Uh, 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 all right, that's 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 fine. G great, that's, that's 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 totally fine. This demonstrates that Jules was more than just a public observer of the trial, but an active participant and de facto agent for the plaintiffs. Lol. And even if she was, I still wouldn't care. Even if she was, I still wouldn't care because she's not the juror. She could, in fact, be a de facto agent. I still wouldn't care. You know, as long as she wasn't, you know, if she became an agent after the trial started, it's not even a lie on the voir dire stuff. No one cares. No one cares about any of this stuff. This, yeah. Jules even publicly shared photographs of herself with, I'm sorry, I apologize. The notorious Jules even publicly shared photographs of herself with plaintiff experts and members of plaintiff's trial team and even appeared center stage in a photograph with the plaintiffs and their counsel after the verdict was read. Noted. In light of Jules' intimate relationship, ooh, it's intimate now. Okay, well, all right. With and bias, judgment is not the same thing as bias. In, uh, I'm sorry, once again, in light of the notorious as Jules' intimate relationship with and bias in favor of the plaintiffs, the development and alignment, if not friendship, between notorious Jules and juror one's wife is alarming. Defendant was entitled to a trial before a fair and impartial jury. The fact that the jury's wife, jury foreman's wife, with whom he resided during the course of the nine-week trial, they, they live together, don't you know? They live together. Yeah. Engaged in friendly discussions while in close proximity to plants advocate Jules. You know, not for nothing, but I don't think Jules was plaintiff's advocate. I'm pretty sure that was the lawyers. Contributes to defendant's reasonable belief that it's been denied his right to a fair trial. Get wrecked. Defendant has also obtained evidence that Mrs. Juror number one, or juror, wife of juror number one, was heavily engaged with the trial online both before and after she physically appeared in court, posting comments about the case that are unequivocally and palpably pro-plaintiff. Pro so what? So what? Maybe she was pro-plaintiff. Maybe she looked at the case and thought plaintiff had the better end of it. Maybe she listened to the case and thought that Johns Hopkins defenses kind of sucked. Eh. Yeah. She, she is allowed to form an opinion, guys. Apparently, I need to explain this to Mr. Shapiro as well. She is, in fact, allowed to form an opinion. She could have a pro-defendant uh, opinion, or she could have a pro-plaintiff opinion. She, she's an independent actor and able to come up. She's, she has her own mind, I think. Operating on her YouTube username, at Hippo Lover. Nice. Nice. She, so we know a couple things about her. She's pro-plaintiff, and she's also pro-hippos. The wife of Juror 1 began posting information, insights, and opinions about the case as early as October the 13th. During live stream cover of the trial on Law and Lumber, shout out Rob, Recovery Addict, and Lawyer You Know YouTube channels. Probably should be an apostrophe S there, but never mind. And follow numerous journalists and vloggers covering the trial, including the producer of the Netflix documentary Take Care of Maya and plaintiff's trial technology consultant. I am still waiting for a time when I care. I am still waiting to care about anything. 
On a nearly, ba nearly basis, the wife of juror number one spent hours online engaged in commentary about the trial proceeding, both in real time and after the trial day had ended. When the jury was set home, are we sure the entire chat is not, is not the wife of juror number one? I'm looking at you guys. I, I see you guys. I see you guys. Many of you were engaged in hours of cons commentary about the trial. I know you both real time and after the trial day and ended. Don't, don't, don't deny it. Don't deny it. You were engaged in hours of commentary about the trial during the trial, before the trial, after the trial, you had opinions, you had thoughts. You expressed those opinions and thoughts. I know you did. I see you guys. You can't hide anything from me. These social media platforms transmitted commentary to audiences of thousands. Yep, that's, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing. Uh, and exposed the juror's wife and brought in the juror's wife's household information about the trial that juror one should not have been able to be aware of as well as, as well as of evidence not made available to the jury. Well, then how did she know it? That doesn't even make sense. So if then she couldn't have gotten it from her husband because the jury didn't know, right? So if it's evidence not made available to the jury, then literally she couldn't have gotten it from her husband because her husband was on the jury. Yeah. In several instances, the juror's wife even donated money to the YouTube channels. They offered live coverage and reaction commentary of the trial to ensure her comments would be spotlighted to thousands of individuals that tuned into the live stream broadcasts. How exciting. How incredibly exciting. This is just all the exciting. I can't even believe how exciting it is in every possible way. I, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know why I care. I don't know why anyone cares. I don't know what's really happening. It's uh, a big pile of stupid. And it, it hurts me, and it hurts me in, in many different ways. I can't even fully contemplate. Um, yeah, uh, it's, just, it's just a big pile of stupid. I keep waiting for it to get better, and it just doesn't get better, and the fact it doesn't get better is kind of irritating me. A lot. So I, I really wish they would stop doing that at any time because it's it's getting annoying. Let's not uh, think about it too hard though, I guess. Okay. Yeah. It strains credulity to believe that they were not discussing the case in violation of the court's instructions. Why? Why does it strain credulity? What about is it that, that strains credulity to you? Do you, 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 you believe that they, they wouldn't honor their oath? Okay, that's exciting. To the contrary, the evidence provides more than a reasonable basis to believe that the wife was exchanging information and belief regarding the case and about defendant's predetermined culpability in violation of the instructions. Um... No, that's not a problem. For instance, during the live testimony of Detective Graham at the time when the detective was under cross-examination by plaintiff's counsel, the juror's wife foreshadowed information she could have only learned from her husband. This is where it's going to get good, right? Finally, on page nine, this is where the, this is where the bombshell is going to drop, right? When she posted the following comment. Yeah. When she posted the following comment, now that I got my donations back on screen, kick ass. The juror law enforcement officer will be asking questions. Okay. Kristen M, who is the maker of the robots, she made the robot juror says Rob was mocked for being careful interviewing this juror. 
looks like he knows what he's talking about. Now the bots are in a filing. The bots are in fact in a filing. And Kristen M, as the maker of the bots, you may have to explain this someday. Exciting. The day prior, the wife of the juror portended, ooh, fancy word choice, portend, ooh, portended a challenge by her husband, juror number one, to Detective Grant when she posted, Detective Grant, LEO officer, juror lull. I don't know what that means on any level. I, I don't really know what that means. Detective Grant, LEO, juror lull. What is this portending? The day prior, the juror's wife portended a challenge by her husband, juror number one, to Detective Graham when she posted, Detective Grant, LEO, juror lull. You're, you're extracting a lot of meaning from this. Um, I have to say. On November the 8th, 2023, while the juror was deliberating, the wife of the juror paid to super chat the following comment. I think the note yesterday was, was frustrated. Juror cannot reach a dollar settlement and will take days. The note yesterday that she would know about because it was in open court. Uh, okay. The juror was apparently interpreting the juror's thoughts in relation to the juror's question the day prior regarding a report, request for a report by the plant's economic expert. And she was right. Her comment contained inside information she could have only obtained from her husband. Or she was observing the trial and speculating as to what the note might mean. As many of you were speculating about the notes means. I mean, you guys and people in general do love to tea leaf, tea leaf read the juror notes. You know, you, you will spend hours, I know you guys, I know you guys, you will spend hours talking about what these juror notes mean and dissecting their every word and nuance even if there's not much there. So she also apparently was doing that and speculating apparently about what it means. I guess she's not allowed to do that. She's not allowed to speculate about what the note read in open court could possibly mean. Okay. On October the 31st of 2023, the day after the testimony of Catherine Betty, the wife of the juror commented, the jury did not like Kathy Betty. Well, she's in the courtroom, right? So she's observing that or otherwise guessing. Or any of the witnesses defendant presented at trial the day prior. But how could they have known whether or not the jury liked him? Aside from information she obtained by her husband. Well, she could have observed it herself. Or she could have talked to other people who observed it and their reactions. Or she could have been looking at other people's commentary and going on that. So, you know, all that stuff. Other comments and posts from the juror's wife reflect that she was doing more than inappropriately engaging with the trial proceedings online. She was even monitoring the court's docket and reviewing court filings. We're all doomed. We're all doomed. Guys, apparently it's really bad. Apparently it's really bad to monitor court filings and dockets because you're interested in cases and wondering what's happening. Apparently the public trials that are happening in the public in a public way, if you, the members of the public, actually pay attention, that's bad. Apparently... That's the sign of a sociopath or something. I, I don't know. That's, that's, that's great. Uh, so she was doing something that she had every legal right to do. Great. For example, on October the 18th of 2023, the juror's wife commented, interesting motion just about the case on DV yesterday on the Sarasota County Clerk of Court. The DV motion by defense basically said the judge granted no appellate court. 
So she read the document that was filed in public. Unless, okay. On November the 3rd, 2023, regarding the joint commission issue that surfaced toward the end of the trial, the juror wrote, deposition today at four in Tampa regarding the documents. Motion is in the court record filed by Mr. Anderson. In that vein, the juror the juror's wife also did Google research on the case as evidenced by her comment. There is a case on Google Carol versus Carol about the judge. Carol's mom about the judge when he was 16 judge Alberton was an appeal judge. Super interesting. So she used Google and found information that she thought was interesting and shared it with other people. Okay, I am now sharing this document and my opinion with you. I think it's interesting. I think it's mostly hilarious, but you know, and I guess you all are conspirators with me. I look forward to being part, and I got this from recovery addict who emailed it to me. I'm part of the conspiracy now. I'm part of the conspiracy of people sharing legal documents and talking about them and sharing thoughts and opinions about it. Exciting. Since we're all part of a gang now, do we get like official gang colors? Do we have to learn an official dance? Who, who's, who's, in, who's, who's in charge of choreography? We need a leader. Okay. The, the juror's wife apparently found this all super interesting and post-worthy. Defense's counsel, Chris Al Al Alterben, was involved years ago in an appeal involving the judge presiding over the trial. I find Supreme Court cases from the 18th century interesting. What the hell are you talking about? Which demonstrates how deeply involved she became in not only observing and commenting on the trial, but in researching about the trials and lawyers and even the judge. How dare she? How dare she research these people? How dare she have an opinion about that? How dare she want to learn more about it? How very dare she? On October, this is, this is not exactly helping me, by the way, endear me to Johns Hopkins side, incidentally. You know, when you throw out garbage, it doesn't exactly help. You know, it's that whole rotten apple spoils the bunch kind of thing. And like, I'm over here, like, you know, Johns Hopkins, I think you might have some viable legal ideas over here and over here and over here. Here's a, here's an idea that might work. Here's an idea that might work. Here's an idea that has, that works. And then you throw this garbage in my face. And, you know, it, it has a tendency of, of putting a sour taste in my mouth. You know, it's like, why are you wasting my time on stuff that clearly doesn't matter? You know, it clearly doesn't matter. You know better. Why are you doing this? Are you just trying to piss me off? Are you just trying to piss the court off? Maybe that's what you're doing. Like, why are you doing this instead of focusing on issues that might actually matter? It's not helping. It's not endearing you to me. I'm just saying. On October the 27th of 2023, the juror's wife commented, I think Sally SM only relied on Tampa General Hospital to decide, discounting all others. The juror's wife was advocating for the plaintiff's position and against the veracity of Dr. Sally Smith on a consequential issue on the case. Well, you know, uh, many people observe Dr. Sally Smith testify and people might have opinions about that. Some people might think Dr. Sally Smith is a very credible witness. Some of them think might, someone might think Dr. Sally Smith is a good person who does things right, or perhaps even a good person who made some small mistakes along the way. That is a potential opinion someone could have. Also, someone might have the exact opposite opinion because people think different things about different people. You know, so she apparently 
was of the opinion, you know what? I've listened to Dr. Sally Smith, and in my opinion, I don't think she's very credible. I don't think that she's a good witness. I don't believe her. Incidentally, this is something also the jury can do. I will, I will paraphrase the standard jury instructions. You know, you, the members of the jury, are the finders of the facts. You may choose to believe a witness in whole or part or none at all. If you believe a witness in part, you may choose to believe them in other parts. If you disbelieve a witness in part, you may choose to disbelieve them in other parts or may choose to believe them in other parts. It's entirely up to you. The evidence is to be weighed by you. You decide how much weight to give a witness. You can, you can give weights to different kinds of witnesses. So even if you, you can choose to believe them in a lot and decide it's really important or decide it's not that important, it's up to you. How much do you believe them? In whole, in part, how important is it? Is it really important? Not that important? It's up to you. She has an opinion. She has an opinion. She thinks that this witness sucks. She's allowed to think this witness sucks. Incidentally, so is the jury. They're not allowed to form an opinion about the case, but that's not the same thing about forming an opinion about a witness or testimony or evidence. They're not allowed to form an ultimate opinion about the case nor should they until it's all concluded. But if they like, you know, that witness has just testified, they blow, that's not forming an opinion about the case. So I just, you know, okay, this is, this is, yeah. And also as Victory notice, uh, Victor, Victoria notices, notes in chat, there's also spousal privilege on top of all this, which I forgot to mention. So I don't know how we're gonna ask any of them about, hey, did you tell your wife X or so? Because it's all privileged. But whatever, never, never mind, minor details for someone else. Not, co not coincidentally, in a proposed question dated October the 12th, the juror number one, why is it not coincidental? How do you know that? They question the court regarding the existence of probable cause of improper actions by or of Sally Smith in her assigned role at JHACH. Has, was she written up or coached? How do you know it's not coincidental? Because they share the same opinion? I'm sure many of the members of the chat have the same opinion. Is that coincidental? Maybe we're all maybe we're all the wife of juror number one. It's a very interesting how who else lives with juror number one? Anyone want to raise their hand in chat? Similarly, on October the 19th of 2023, while the jury was formulating questions relating to the testimony of Johanna Klink, juror wife's the juror's wife wrote they should ask if the nurse lied. Okay, the juror's wife posts as compared with juror one's questions are additional evidence of improper contacts and communications between them warranting both a juror interview and a new trial. Absolutely not, get wrecked. Absolutely not, get wrecked. Though several of her comments and posts, the wife of juror one also inappropriately expressed concern the clock was running out for the plaintiffs. Many of you express concern. I think even I express concern at some points. I express concerns about this a lot on the clock. I express concerns about this during the Paxton trial. For example, I, I, express, I express concerns. I expressed concerns during the Johnny Depp trial. We were watching the clock and, you know, Elaine apparently wasn't watching the clock, who apparently was all surprised Pikachu face when she was told she had whatever, four minutes or whatever it was, you know, surprised Pikachu face. So you shouldn't count our sidebar time. I wasn't. So yeah, many of us had concerns. For example, in four separate comments posted on October the 17th, the juror's wife wrote, Anderson is burning time. He won't have any left to defend. He needs to be more careful in time. I think you're right. Depots to burn time and burning witnesses and bringing witnesses that will burn Anderson. So he'll use time. I wonder if the defense are getting these witnesses. So Anderson runs out of time. Don't burn your hours, Anderson, please. We need you. That's pretty sound advice, by the way. Just generally, please don't burn your time. You know, but why would the juror's wife be of the opinion? The plants were running out of time. If she wasn't discussing the case with her husband, I don't know. Maybe she has a brain. Maybe she hears how much time is left and she's like, hey, the clock is running. Tick, 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 tick. What does Mr. Watch say? What does Mr. Watch say? Mr. Watch is saying, get your ass moving, kid. 
you know? Yeah. So, like, uh, how would she, why would she have that opinion? A lot of people would have that opinion. Clock, clock, clock. It's moving. Let's go. Her bias, bias isn't the same thing as judgment, in favor of the plaintiffs and depths of knowledge regarding the case. Maybe she just pays attention. Some of you guys have pretty deep, deep knowledge, too. In her role as the jury four person's wife. That's not a role. That's not a role. In her role as jury four person. Wh who assigned her this role? She has a role? What are you talking about? Is undeniable and palpable. I am I am looking you straight in the face and I'm denying it. This is this is crazy. This is stupid. This is a waste of everyone's time and you know it is. Why are you doing this? Is it because you don't have anything better to do? Okay. And creates more than a reasonable basis to believe what defendants suspected when they filed their motion to disqualify. Juror number one, Sarah, shares the same bias. Bias is not the same thing as judgment. The juror's wife also somehow knew or believed that the jury was asking questions when they were that were purportedly serving to save the play of time on the shot clock. What? For example, in October the 19th, 2023, the juror's wife wrote, maybe Anderson will cross after questions to save time. On October the 19th, 2023, the juror's wife posted, so proud of Anderson, he was like a cat, no questions after, just to pounce after the jury's questions. Kudos. Maybe they, maybe the, maybe the council saw the comments. Maybe they thought that was a good idea. Maybe they had the same idea independently. You know, there are a bunch of lawyers looking at this thing, trying to figure out ways to strategize. Do you think like the juror's wife is just like in some sort of hyper unique position to know this or, or, or really, or what are you trying to say? Are you trying to say juror's wife is actually practicing law? That's good. Yeah. Jurors, juror, juror's wife is actually the real counsel. Big brain, big brain. You cracked the case. The juror's wife is the real lead counsel. The other people in court at the desks are just shadow counsel. Juror's wife is the one pulling the strings behind the scenes. She rigged, she rigged, she rigged the jury. Don't you know? She rigged the clerk's office and she got the summons sent to her husband so that he would get on the jury. Her pawn in the whole thing it was, it was juror's wife behind the whole thing the whole time. She, she took over the case. She hijacked it counsel. She, she broke into the clerk's office. She ensured her husband would get on the case. She whipped him into compliance. <laughs> Wow. The juror's wife paid a super chat for the following comment. If the plan runs out of time, can the depositions be played since the part goes to the time? Yeah. On October 25th, 2023, the juror's wife commented, yes, more hours for plaintiff. In response to continued questions from the jurors, the wife commented, jury love it. Even if evidence of shared alignment between juror one and his wife, I think, I think there is some evidence of alignment between juror one and his wife. I am, I, I, I as to the desired outcome of the trial, we're not so compelling and it is defendant would still satisfy the standard for a jury interview. No, you wouldn't the standard is evidence, evidence of misconduct, not wishes, not hope, not speculation, not dreams, evidence. Yeah. 
specifically the entire internet community. Wow, all of it, really? I didn't even know that was possible. The entire internet community was made aware of the heavy bias in plaintiff's favor on the part of the juror's wife. Wow, the juror's wife is even more powerful than I thought. Not only did she corrupt the clerk's office in order to get her husband selected, not only did she hijack the legal team and was actually chief counsel, but apparently she somehow hijacked the entire internet to make sure that everyone on the internet, all of us, were aware of this. Juror's, juror's wife must be stopped. She is simply too powerful. Specifically, the entire internet community was made aware of the heavy bias in plaintiff's favor on the part of juror's wife, plainly compromising the integrity of the jury's process. Even if somehow the entire internet did know that, it still wouldn't be a problem because juror number one wasn't doing that. As will be shown, even an appearance of impropriety warrants a new trial as a matter of public policy under Florida law. Lol. Lol. As his wife and household companion, did you know they live together, guys? Did you know they share a household? Did you know that? During the course of the nine-week trial, and I bet you they're still hold, I bet you they're still household companions even after the trial. I'm just guessing. The juror's wife was serving as juror's one agent to the internet world. Wow. Exciting. The juror's wife has compromised the public confidence in the integrity of the jury system through her biased posts, bias isn't the same thing as judgment, and improper emotional investment. She's a woman and she has improper emotional investment. Just, just noting that juxta juxtaposition there. Just noting that, let's just take a little note there. Given her role as juror number one spouse, who assigned her this role? What role are you talking about? Her actions also brought information into the household this court prohibited the jurors from reviewing. How do you know that? How do you, how do you know that? On November the 6th of 2023, the court heard defendant's motion to disqualify the juror which was a stupid motion, and I laughed pretty hard, which was premised on juror number one's suspected bias and prejudice. <sighs> bias is not the same thing as judgment. In favor of the plaintiffs, plaintiffs' counsel, Mr. Anderson, changed his position several times during the course of oral argument to defend this motion. Now, this by far and away is the best part of the document for Johns Hopkins because I will give them this much. This part of the trial by Mr. Anderson was pretty cringe. It was pretty cringe and I mocked it pretty hard on my program. Mr. Anderson looked like a complete incompetent fool and uh, it was not, it was definitely not one of the highlights of the thing. So uh, I'll give him this much. The Johns Hopkins found something that was embarrassing. So that's nice, I guess. Plaintiff's counsel, Mr. Anderson, changed his position several times throughout the course of the oral argument. Upon being pressed for a response by the court, Mr. Anderson replied, I changed my mind. I'll go with juror number 106. So I'll agree with you. The court then pressed again because he kept like changing his mind because immediately after he said that, he said something like, I don't want any appellate issues or something. He like qualified his marks immediately. And the judge was like, what do you want? It took him, a fa it took him like half hour to get to what do you want? It was so, it was so unnerving. Then as the court was outlining the agreement with the parties and identifying which alternate would take the place, Mr. Anderson abruptly announced, you know who I didn't check with throughout the whole thing? My client. After about 15 seconds, Mr. Anderson changed his opinion yet again and announced, I'm going with my client. I have to switch positions because my client feels more comfortable with juror number one. So I'm going to switch positions based on my client's input. Okay, please tell me how this wasn't really the client. Please tell me how this is the wife of juror number one who has somehow manipulated the way into, into Mr. Into the, into Maya's father's heart. So what, what is it? What is, uh, what is wife of juror number one? Is she a temptress? 
Is she a siren? Is she a... Uh, is she a succubus who has manipulated even Maya's father, an otherwise stalwart man who is now but a puppet at her whim? Damn, the powers of juror, the powers of the wife of juror number one get more and more powerful every day. All right, so okay, how is how is your number wife or or notorious in in, in responsible for this? In response, Mr. Kowalski, who advocated to keep juror number one on the jury, can be seen turning to notorious jewels. Yeah, she's Lilith. There you go, Lilith. That's a good reference. Be seen turning to notorious jewels and nodding his head with a smile. Notorious. Yeah, this is this is this is a little anti-woman at this point. Uh, I just make note. Jules is Jules is a succubus. <laughs> Juror's wife is a succubus. They're all Lilith. They're all the devil. <laughs> okay. Okay, this exchange was further evidence of an alignment between the plaintiffs and jewels to insulate a verdict in plaintiffs' favor by ret retaining juror number one, who along with his wife was heavily biased in plaintiffs' favor. Bias is not the same thing as judgment. Okay. What the defendant suspected before the verdict, based on juror number one's questions, that is, the bias between or bias in favor of the plans, bias is not the same thing as judgment, warrants his removal as a juror and replacement with alternative was demonstrated beyond just a reasonable belief after the verdict. I'm still waiting for anything that's reasoned, by the way. When I hear reasonable, I mean reasoned. And what you have is speculations, dreams, and wishes, which is not the same thing. Yeah. Specifically, the juror's wife was not the only member of the husband and wife pair to engage in internet postings regarding the case. Following the verdict, at which time juror number one can talk to whomever he wants, juror number one joined his wife on these public platforms by immediately posting to the Take Care of My Facebook page, which he can do because he's free. A plaintiff favorite internet community, hotly opposed to any commentary favoring the defense, Created in response to the calculated and sensationalized Take Care of Maya Netflix series. Well, I'm not sure how t calculated and sensationalized it was because the consensus seems to be roughly that, you know, the the verdict is that the, the testimony was somewhat, you know, in alignment with the series. So it wasn't that sensationalized. It's just a really bad case for John Hopkins. Johns Hopkins did some bad shit. Thank you, True Chime Junkie, the OG for becoming an uncivilian. We do appreciate everyone who hits the beautiful, beautiful join button. And thank you also to Charlie, Charlie Lynn for also becoming a member and hitting the beautiful, beautiful join button. It is only 99 cents a month. We do try to make it as affordable as possible so that everyone can join. And we do appreciate everyone who helps me because it allowed me to buy this brand new microphone, which I just got today. And I'm using to talk to you now in this higher quality, very exciting. So we're all trying to make things better and more enjoyable for you. Turning back to the disaster area that is this filing. Juror number one quickly posted, oh no, that's too funny, too cool too, to an AI generated image of the judge in battle gear standing in front of a smoking picture of the building with the caption, I went and got the IJ documents myself. I have the exhibits. We will look at this meme if it kills me. The impropriety of the image of a judge presiding over this highly publicized trial, condemning the defense, coupled with the jury foreman's undisguised delight in the image, is additional, it's after, he can have any opinion he wants. What are you talking about? You're just saying things. You're saying things and they don't make sense and they make me mad. I'm about two steps away from just, you know, just, you know, Kurt mad, grr. I'm about two steps away from just mad. On November 10th of 2023, the day after the verdict was announced, the juror's wife posted a photo 
of juror number one on the Take Care of My Facebook page. Thank you everyone for stuck up for the juror, presumably referencing the defense motion to disqualify the juror. The same day, juror number one posted the following comment. While the other jurors were excluded down to be transported, I was asked to remain by the lieutenant. Oh boy, I'm in trouble once again. But it was just for some, but it was just, it was for just some security talk about that oops. Uh, okay, I, 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 all right, fine. Juror number one's comment about being in trouble once again indicates that he knew prior to being released from the courthouse, the defendant had moved to dismiss him. No, maybe it just is that he gets in trouble sometimes. You know, or it's just a saying or like anything else. This is this is this is screaming desperation in so many languages, Laurie. I don't even know where to start. This is screaming. This is screaming desperate. And it's it's so palpably desperate that you don't need a law degree to know how desperate it is. You don't need a law degree to know how desperate this is. This is some pretty weak sauce. And my response is mostly laughing in their face, to be quite honest. Yeah. So, okay. The fact that juror number one exposed information relating to defendants motion to remove him. Wait a second. When was this? The same day. The day after the verdict was announced. Wait a second. No, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Because after he was released, he might know about the motion. So your own timing doesn't make sense. In your motion, it doesn't make sense in your timing. Okay, so I want to go through this again because Johns Hopkins doesn't seem to realize their own timing. Okay, November the 10th, the day after the verdict was announced. Okay, so at this point, the juror is released. At this point, the juror can talk to his wife or anyone else about whatever he wants to. At this point, he could talk or maybe he watched the trial again. I don't know what he does in his free time. Maybe he liked the trial so much he went to YouTube and watched it again. I have no clue. Maybe he read a newspaper article about it, whatever. So like the day after the trial, maybe he learned that he was being trying to be being removed. So like his comment that he posts the day after the verdict, while the other jurors were excluded down to be transported, I was asked to remain. Oh boy, I'm in trouble once again. Then they say juror number one's comment about being, being in trouble indicate, indicates they knew prior to being released from the courthouse. No, it doesn't because he's writing this post after the jury's over. So he might know that now because he could talk to about it. Could Mrs. Juror 1 sue for defamation? No, sadly not, because it's in an official filing litigation privilege. So, sadly, no. Mrs. Juror 1 cannot sue for defamation, but know in my heart, but know in our hearts, juror number, Mrs. Juror number 1, that we all think this is some bullshit, so it doesn't matter. It's fine. Uh, so, yeah, so it doesn't indicate that because they understand their own timeline. The fact juror number one was exposed to this information regarding defense motion to remove him as a juror in violation of the court's instructions is further evidenced by the juror's wife's post thanking the group who stuck up for her husband. This is all after the trial is over. So what are you talking about? It probably came up in conversation, I bet. Juror number one continued to post in the plain favored Facebook group. Well, you know who else is favored? Uh, the entire rest of the jury. They're all kind of pro plaintiff, to be a little bit honest, because they actually heard the evidence. They think Johns Hopkins sucks balls. Juror number one continued his post in the plaintiff's favorite Facebook group, which hailed him as a hero for being responsible for the verdict against defendant hospital. After the verdict was announced, they still had to hear testimony on punitive damages and deliberate, so they were not released. They were by the next day, weren't they? Because that was pretty fast. So the next day, I believe they were released. So anyways, but um, yeah, okay. Yeah, wasn't, 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 wasn't the jury done the next day? Because it was very quick. The, the, so yeah. So they would have been dismissed that evening. So maybe on timing. $10 from KC Cat. Defense filed another motion for mistrial on the grounds judge erred in allowing the IJ report in saying it was irrelevant. Uh-huh. And Dr. Goodhair never saw it because they failed to produce it under court order. 
Yeah, it's it's pretty relevant. Yeah. Yeah, that night they were done, right? So that would be the next day. And also when they say the verdict, I'm not sure what they exactly mean, incidentally, because my timeline isn't that strong, but either way. Um, while juror number one made sure to repeatedly express that it was not solely his decision, he seemed to enjoy his newfound notoriety among these online platforms by engaging in posts and videos celebrating him as a hero. I'm sure he did appreciate that. Everyone likes to be liked. Nikki Lewis gives two Canadian dollars to say motion for disjudgment to review that document. It's a pile of stupid, I'm quite sure. We've already had this already, incidentally, so it's even more piles of stupid. To date, juror number one continues to post about the case, even to the point of advising the internet community regarding filings that will be made on Wednesday, November 22nd. The internet community, in turn, has suggested juror number one remain humble and quiet out of respect for the process. It's nice to know that the internet community apparently reached consensus. Was there a meeting? I don't remember. But as defendant has shown by the evidence, juror number one apparently has no respect for the judicial process or defendant's right to a fair trial before an impartial juror. If juror number one is a free agent and can do whatever the hell he wants. Verdict and punitive damages were done on November 9th. Okay, thank you for clarifying the timeline. So yeah, so if, if the, so if, Punitive damages were done by the 9th, then on the 10th, then he would know everything. So I'm still back with the timeline doesn't make sense. Thank you for clarifying. If interviewed, which is definitely not going to happen, defendant expects juror number one to respond with a self-serving denial. It's nice to know that you think juror number one will perjure themselves, incidentally. So that's just great. So you think juror number one broke their oath, and you also think they're going to perjure themselves if asked questions under oath. That's exciting. I'm sure juror number one feels super, super thrilled with he, your feelings about his character. Even if interviewed, defendant expects juror number one to respond with a self-serving denial of any communications with his wife about the trial. But on Facebook, juror number one loved a comment by a user praising the fact that his whole family was able to come to court and observe the trial. Okay. In another comment, when a user pointed out the juror number one's wife, being in the audience could be a problem for the verdict, which incidentally, it absolutely is not because it's a public courtroom. Juror number one laughed at the comment to mock it because it's stupid. Juror number one also liked a comment from the group, which advised him to be careful regarding what questions he asked, as a new trial could be granted if he says something now that implies he made up his mind, which is theoretically possible, but he'd have to try pretty hard. And this isn't it. This isn't it. This isn't it, Chief. These posts demonstrate that juror number one's bias, bias is not the same thing as judgment, was served as the basis for defendant's motion to disqualify the juror, was apparent to plaintiff's favorite online communities he support, juror number one. Why else would juror number one need to be careful if he remained impartial throughout the trial? Because he might say something that could be twisted by you fucks. How about that? Maybe you fucks will take anything he says and twist it and distort it to mean what you want to mean. So maybe he needs to be careful because you're a bunch of assholes. How about that? And why these users worry about juror number one being in the audience? Because of you assholes, I'm pretty sure. That's just a guess. On November the 11th of 2023, juror number one also joined the Law & Lumber YouTube stream. If they need a character witness against Rob, I'm here for it. Let me know, I'm available. Love you, Rob. He also, they've also apparently paid the host known as Rob, his name is Rob, a hundred dollars and comment that he'd be happy to discuss the case with him. Rob, a lawyer himself, sweet. Yeah. Uh, appear, appreciating the appearance of improperly, appear, appreciating the appearance of impropriety arising out of juror number one's communication, advised juror number one to first consult with counsel before speaking publicly. I thought it was overly cautious, but apparently Rob thought that Johns Hopkins was a bunch of assholes and would twist things too. So I actually disagreed with Rob at the time. I didn't make a point of it because why, but you know, maybe Rob was right all along. So there you go. 
Juror number one paid Rob $2 in return for the advice, commenting agreed. Next, they're going to be arguing that juror number one is now Rob's client. I look forward to that. That should be exciting. Juror number one later removed several of his comments from the Facebook group. Evidence that he too realized the appearance of improprieties for his actions was demonstrating to the internet community, and therefore his conduct was necessarily underpinning public comments in the integrity of the jury system. On November the 19th of 2023, shortly before following this motion, juror number one admitted to the Take Care of My Facebook group that he had contacted plaintiff's counsel, which he's allowed to do, who advised him that this very motion would be filed. Okay. Believe by this Wednesday, defense has to say something. The judge see actually makes some reviews and rulings before actually hitting the gavel and closing this phase of the case. So we're listening to counsel as it ain't over yet. Okay. He talked to counsel. Counsel gave him some suggestions. He took the advice. Wow. Deep. That's, 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 that's amazing. On juror 15, Law and Lumber's hosted plaintiff expert, Dr. John Cochran on his live stream. I don't even know what to say about this. This is just so stupid. Why am I not mentioned in a filing? Please mention me in a filing. Here's a picture for your thing. Put that as a thumbnail in your filing. That'll be good. All right. Dr. Cochran spoke about his view that the video of the then current CEO and then interim CEO of Johns Hopkins All Children's Filing should not have been excluded in the punitive damages phase. And that if it had not, you can ask juror number one. They would have put another zero on the punitive damages. Maybe they talked to each other. Whoa. In response, juror number one commented they would have also added 14 zeros. Which is, let's see, millions, billions... See, so six is millions, nine is billions, 12 is trillions. So 14's in the quadrillions. That's a lot of money. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In addition to the above improper content, maybe I should ask them to appear. Maybe I should ask the people who filed this to appear on my channel. That'd be good. Maybe I'll call their office. Say, do you want to appear on my channel? We can talk all about it. It'll be great. <laughs> yeah, uh, Matt Bond says, I remember somewhat uh, the judge saying at the end, their service is over and they're free to speak to whoever they like. I remember that too, Matt. I remember that too. In addition to the above improper context, they're totally proper. He's allowed to talk to the attorneys. It's over. Defend apparently they're not calling your office. I wonder why. Defendant has a reasonable basis to believe that juror number one also inappropriately conducted internet research regarding one or more issues in the case in violation of the court's order not to consider information outside the evidence of the jury. On October the 9th of 2023, juror number one posed the following question to Maya Kowalski. When it comes to creature conference, were you made to feel comfortable or were you made to or just felt that you were in a hostile place? The phrase creature comfort is not used by any witness at trial, but is used on Dr. Kirkpatrick's RSD Foundation website related to ketamine therapy. Well, guys, I, I have to take back everything I said. I, I, I have to take back everything I said. I mean, Johns Hopkins really has this motion locked down because I, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, juror number one used the phrase creature comforts. And that phrase is also used on their website. And that's the only place or only time that you would ever hear that phrase. I mean, I've never heard the phrase creature comforts ever before. Have you? I mean, I've, I've, I've never heard that before. So the only possible way this juror could use that phrase, it must be that he got it from the website using the exact same phraseology. There is no other possible explanation. Johns Hopkins has this in the bag. <sighs> 
the treatment. Treatments are performed with a four-day high-dose ketamine infusion on an outpatient basis at the Foundation Surgery Center. For information on our research on ketamine coma procedure, please visit our research section. The key to success is to get a dose of ketamine as high as possible and hold the dose up for as long as possible with safety and creature comfort as a primary concern. Measuring critical out clinical outcome on an objective basis is also critical to our success. Moreover, in videos on his website depicting his treatment of other females as a similar age as Maya, Dr. Kirkpatrick also uses the phrase creature comforts when speaking to patients about the cir circumstances under which the ketamine is most effective. Is defendant's reasonable belief based on the foregoing? The juror visited Dr. Kirkpatrick's website to research issues on the case. You have got to be absolutely shitting me. There is not enough bullshit for this. Including with respect to diagnosis and treatment of CRPS in violation of the court's order. Finally, it appears based on a public search of Sarasota County Court Docket that Deborah Salisbury was involved in juror wife's 2007 Who's Deborah Salisbury? Deborah Salisbury was the attorney who represented Jack Kowalski in the underlying DCF proceedings, who also served as a witness for plaintiff in the action and was featured heavily in the Netflix documentary about the case, Take Care of Maya. However, due to the protected status of documents in the court document, it's not easily discernible whether attorney Salisbury represented the wife in that manner. Okay, so she's an attorney who represented Jack Kowalski in proceedings before the Department of Children and Families and served as a witness for the plaintiffs in this action. Okay, so Deborah Salisbury, the attorney, was involved in the juror's wife 2007 domestic relation proceedings involved how we don't know a fact that was never disclosed on the jurors jury questionnaire why would it be why would it be because it goes to his wife not him and uh, okay similarly similarly juror one denied viewing the netflix documentary relating to the case take care of maya on a supplemental juror questionnaire and denied having any conversations or overhearing any conversations concerning the movie this seems unlikely yeah that's definitely gonna punch the ticket unlikely that's definitely what the judge is looking for <sighs> this is unlikely given the wife's heavy engagement investment and close monitoring the case the court docket and her following on social media the movie productors for the site maybe she's more interested than her husband is You ever think of that? Someone in chat once told me that 80% of true crime people are women. Maybe, maybe, her, maybe the wife is really interested. Maybe the husband doesn't care that much. Maybe they're different people with different interests sometimes. The way they tell the story, it seems that husband and wives are inevitably, inevitably at lockstep. Apparently wives when they get married, lose all personality and agency and autonomy in every possible way. That's an interesting perspective, I guess. Juror number one's post-trial post to take care of my Facebook group further undermines his feigned ignorance of the documentary. Uh-huh. Evidence of a juror misconduct on the part of juror one, both individually and arising out of wife's involvement in the case, so whatever social media posts and obvious bias biases isn't the same thing as judgment is substantially prejudicial and comp compromises the integrity of the verdict, the jury system and judicial process as a whole. You sure you don't want to wave the flag any harder while you're at it? Damn. The evidence gives rise to a reasonable belief that juror one impermissibly obtained and shared information about the case during the course of the trial with and through his wife, as well as plaintiff advocate, the notorious Jules. Jules getting some print time over here. Notorious. Ooh, 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 ooh. Notorious. Thank you, A Capitan, for the five gift memberships. That's very nice of you. Uh, in violation of the court's instructions or requirements of Florida law, and because the evidence uh, because the evidence provides a reasonable basis for inquiry, it doesn't even close come close to that. I'm not done laughing. 
Um, defendant moves for an interview of juror number one. That will absolutely not happen. In support of the motion for a new trial, and the court's discretion for an interview of juror number one's In addition, defendant further li requests limited discovery now into the issue of the juror's misconduct in anticipation of the interview, as well as an emergency order no, requiring juror one and his wife to preserve text messages, social media activity, and other electronic data. <sighs> okay. Let's go over the legal standard. In a motion for a new trial, the rules permit a party to move for a jury interview if the party believes that grounds for a legal challenge to a verdict may exist. An interview of the juror is proper when there's reasonable basis to believe that a prejudicial act occurred supporting a legal basis for a new trial, such as improper contact with the trial or misconduct. Uh huh. A party moving for a jury interview does not have to conclusively establish the alleged incident occurred and is actually prejudiced. Instead, it's only necessary to establish a basis of inquiry. In contrast to what is needed to prove entitlement to a new trial, a party seeking only a jury interview must set forth sworn factual allegations that, if true, would require a new trial to be ordered. Well, you haven't done any of that, so I don't care. In this regard, a party should be allowed the opportunity to prove that it's entitled. Contact with a jury juror during a trial about the pending matter, as defendant believes occur in this case, constitutes presumptively prejudicial conduct. Thank you, Dog Mom, for the gift memberships. It does really help. I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who supports this channel financially. This is my primary income, so I really do appreciate everyone who supports this channel and helps me to grow and this channel. You guys mean the world to me. And it's because of you guys that I uh, that I try so hard to provide good quality content. For those of you who are unfamiliar with my channel, just by the way, I provide general legal analysis. I do a lot of Supreme Court stuff. Last, time, last term, I think I did every single Supreme Court case in the term. Uh, the Supreme Court is just now sitting. They start in the first Monday of October. So they've been hearing oral arguments, so no decisions yet to discuss, but we do we do, do oral argument reviews and we do Court of Appeals decisions and we also do some pop culture stuff as is appropriate. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff and the occasional true crime thing, we do some stuff in that genre as well occasionally. So if you're interested in a comprehensive legal analysis, that's what I attempt to do. And I have over 2,500 videos on my channel, so plenty of content for you to watch. Anyways, where was I? Once the improper conduct has... Thank you, Dog Mom, for the five gift memberships. Once the improper conduct has been established, the burn then shifts to the party seeking to preserve the jury's verdict to demonstrate the conduct was harmless. In this regard, once improper conduct or jury misconduct is established by a jury interview, the moving party is then entitled to a new trial unless the opposing party can demonstrate there's no reasonable possibility the jury misconduct affected the verdict. A juror who's biased or prejudiced is not fair-minded and impartial, as required to prevent the impairment of the right of a jury trial. You guys had voir dire, eat it. Earbuds in the kitchen said the ask about voir dire about Deborah Salisbury. They probably would have asked a more generic question. They probably would have asked a question in voir dire like, do you have any relationship to any of the parties or any of the attorneys? So they would probably ask that. But again, it's his wife, not him. So, yeah. Crazy Cat Queen says, motion for Kurt to move to Florida and become counsel advisor so the hospital can be better. Hospital needs a lot of help. Hospital needs a lot of help. The importance of an impartial jury is so fundamental that it is initially scrutinized at the inception of a trial on challenges for cause. Yeah, we're, we're, well, we're well past that now. Yeah, the standard you need to dismiss a juror before they're seated and after they're seated are quite different things. So, yeah, you don't need as much to unseat a juror or to not seat the juror in the first place. Once they're seated. Yeah. Evidence of misconduct is also evaluated after the jury is seated. Well, it'd be pretty hard to have misconduct before they're seated. I'm not even sure that's hypothetically possible. How could you have juror misconduct before they're seated? That would be a neat trick. Specifically, it's within the trial court's discretion to grant a new trial when the latter is suspected because the jury has been tainted based on the basic premise that the parties are entitled to a fair trial. Uh-huh. 
Do they have any evidence? No. In a prior case, for example, the fourth district determined the evidence of conversations between a jury foreman and his brother, who was an agent of defendant's liability insurer, warranted a new trial, even though the juror testified in a post-trial deposition that no substantive matters concerning the case were discussed. The fourth district noted the trial judge had expressly and repeatedly instructed the jury they were prohibited from discussing the case with third parties in order to prevent outside influence, and further instructed them not to prematurely form an opinion as to the merits of the case or receive any evidence outside the courtroom. Notwithstanding the court's explicit instruction, the offending juror admitted engaging in two separate conversations with his brother regarding the case during the three-day trial. Yeah, well, you know, when it comes to did you talk to your wife, spousal privilege all day long, spousal privilege until you die. I don't even care if you didn't do it, just invoke spousal privilege anyway. You always invoke privilege, right? Like, did you talk to your wife about this, spousal privilege? Even if I didn't, I'll invoke spousal privilege, screw you. 9.99 9.99 from Carla Riley. Thank you very much for the super chat and for the fox hugging a heart. I feel loved. Thank you. The fourth district determined the jury's conversations with his brothers constitute objective acts that compromise the integrity of the fact-finding process and represent an instance of improper conduct with which he shall not be tolerated as a matter of public policy. The court referred to a general rule that potentially harmful misconduct is presumptively prejudicial and that contact with a juror during a trial about the pending matter falls within this category. Thank you, Coral Saul, for the five gift memberships. I know I've missed some of the super chats and gift memberships along the way. I will go back and read them all. But I'm trying to hit ones as I can and not interrupt my flow. Because the record demonstrates that potentially prejudicial communication occurred and defended not to spell the presumption of prejudice, the court determined the juror's relationship to and conversations with his brother substantially undermined plaintiff's right to a fair trial, compromised the integrity of a new jury trial, and thwarted substantial justice warranting the new trial. Defendant submits that it too is entitled to a new trial as a matter of public policy based on the undeniable appearance of impropriety arising out of the actions and conduct of juror one and his wife. I don't know why, but something about reading juror one and his wife just seems somehow so dismissive. I'm not sure there's a better way to refer to her, but somehow it just seems so dismissive, like she's in the side or an afterthought. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. In this regard, defendant believes juror interview will shed additional light on the misconduct demonstrated by this motion and accompanying affidavit. And even if misconduct is denied, as defendant predicts, so you're predicting he's going to lie. That's cute. Neither juror one nor his wife can erase the appearance of impropriety. <laughs> Lol. The appearance of impropriety in turn presents an independent basis for a new trial. Ah, uh, man, good times. Defendant submits that he satisfied the standard not even close for obtaining a juror interview based on juror number one suspected contacts and communications with his wife. Presumed receipt, receipt, uh, uh, receipt of information from outside influence and some parent internet researchers during the trial. I will be truly amazed if the judge does this because like piercing the sanctity of the jury, man, dude, come on. Do, do you have evidence of a payoff? Do you, do you have evidence of threats? You know, do you have evidence that they're on the take? Bribes? Do you have any of that? That'd be good. <sighs> and I, I appreciate the comedy, though. I, I'm, I'm having a good laugh. You know, I'm having a good laugh, and that makes it all worthwhile. Evidence of juror one suspected bias. Bias isn't the same thing as judgment. In favor of plaintiffs, more specifically set forth in the motion disqualify, has been compounded and confirmed by unsolicited evidence. Discovered post-trial involving heavy social media participation in the trial on the part of the wife and presumptive agent, the juror's wife, as well as the juror's wife's presence in that trial, and friendly communications with plaintiff's advocates, the notorious Jules. Tim Riggs gifts 10 gift memberships. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's awesome. Jules, 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 Jules. Jules, how deep does the conspiracy go? How deep and wide? (laughs) 
It has been also confirmed on Jurors One's own social media participation post trial, which even the internet community is recognized as indicative of juror taint. <laughs> they said taint and misconduct. As noted, the social media posts include information she could have only obtained from her husband or, you know, paying attention. The evidence, therefore, provides a reasonable basis for a defendant to believe that Juror 1 communicated his wife during the trial regarding the case in violation of instructions. Such communications, in turn, constitute misconduct. The record herein incorporates, demonstrates potentially prejudicial communications between Juror 1 and his wife, who may or may not be an independent human being, we're not sure, given this motion, lol. Occurred during the course of the nine-week trial, defendant does not have to conclusively establish that misconduct occurred and actually is prejudicial to its case, but only the basis for an inquiry. Defendant has satisfied its burden by supporting its motion for an interview. As in a case called Snook, great name, juror one is alleged to have deliberately disregarded the court's instruction not to discuss the case and base the verdict solely on the evidence presented during trial. I don't know. There was quite a bit of evidence at trial. It seems to me that doesn't seem to cast Johns Hopkins necessarily in the greatest light, but that just seems to be, you know, one man's opinion. Johns Hopkins did some sketchy shit at some points. Juror number one's Mrs. Juror's wife, the juror's wife, not only demonstrated a shocking alignment with an emotional investment, there is those women with those emotional, emotional investments, too emotionally invested, tsk, 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 in favor of plaintiff, but as the wife of the jury foreman. Her conduct threatens the integrity of the judicial process. Defendant at minimum is therefore entitled to interview juror number one, determine the nature and extent of the communications with his wife. If the social media posts and commentary are any indication, those communications have been substantial in direct violation of this court's instruction to the jury. Jasmine Braids gives 20 Canadian dollars to say, Kurt, you simply make me happy. I wish you joy and that amazing things come your way. Thank you very much. I appreciate your contribution, Jasmine. That's very, very kind of you. Thank you. And you also help to make me happy. All right. Defendant believes it will establish improper contacts and communications between juror number one. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm sure the bot has told you from time to time, but if any of you happen to be on Twitch and also happen to have Amazon Prime, first of all, would you be so kind as to please go to my Twitch page, twitch.tv slash law? First of all, would you follow my Twitch? And second of all, if you have Amazon Prime, you can subscribe, which is equivalent to paying me for free. So you can become a member for free. It costs you nothing. So if you have Amazon Prime, if you go over to Twitch T if you go over to twitch.tv slash uncivil law, you can you have to renew it every month. You have to do it manually. But if you subscribe, which is their paid version, it costs you nothing and you help support the channel. So if you do that, that'd be kind. Thank you. Defendant one believes it will establish improper contacts and communication between juror number one and his wife during the trial or other juror misconduct, such as improper internet research by the jury interview. If so, defendant will be entitled to a new trial as a matter of law, unless plaintiff can demonstrate there's no reasonable possibility the jury misconduct will affect the verdict. Thank you, David, for the $2. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. In the face of substantial evidence of presumptively prejudicial jury misconduct, culminating in an exorbitant verdict, <laughs> warring plaintiffs every dollar requested on every count, which I think is not quite correct. I think they technically requested more, um, which itself should shook the jury's con judicial constants. Defendant submits it will be impossible for plans to satisfy their burn of demonstrating no reasonable possibility the jury misconduct affected the verdict. You never had to re manually reset your Amazon Prime on Twitch? I always have to. So I always have to do it every month. It automatically expires. So if you don't have to, then that's cool. But it always expires to me. So I'm not sure that that's true. It's definitely not true for me. So I'll let you know. But either way, I appreciate your support. And I'm planning on dual streaming. In fact, I believe I'm streaming to Twitch as we speak. I hope I am. Because they now support dual streaming, so why not? We get an audience over there, too. Not surprisingly, defendant has not located a reported decision revealing the extent of the social media participation and blatant bias exhibited in the case. That's always a good sign when you can't find any precedent. That's always a really super-duper sign. 
So you not only want the court to weak on you not only want the court to act on weak ass evidence, but you want the court to be a court of first impression. Hey, this is the first time that's ever happened. You want to create new law on this record? How exciting! Azeroth on chat, Twitch chats. Yep, see, it works. Yeah, so we get chat over from Twitch. How exciting! Yeah, so we get chat from both integrated. That's nice. But the motion does not involve a mere instance of tweeting and blogging or alleged juror misconduct arising from the use of social media during the trial. Rather, the evidence present reveals a shocking and pervasive use of social media by the spouse of a jury for person who I guess also was under court order somewhere along the line. I'm not sure how. Um, with whom the juror resided during the course of nine week trial. Did you know they lived together? Did you know they're living together? They are shacking up people. They are shacking up. Who, who would do that? Who would live with their spouse in their home? I hear rumors that they might even share a bed. I know. It's truly outrageous. How could they ever do such a thing? The evidence also reveals juror number one's participation in the same... <laughs> Wow, I just had a really dirty joke go through my mind. Let's press on. Uh, same social media activity post-trial demonstrating a shared bias in plans favor on the part of the juror's wife. The juror's wife should have displayed an extra level of respect. Why? Why? She comes along for the ride because she's married to him? So she's literally, so she literally is not fully a full person. So other people don't have to explain an extra level of respect, but she does because it wouldn't be proper for the wife of, uh, the wife of the, the king to, to be in disrespect. You know, no one wants the wife of, uh, you know, the wife to be, Hey, someone subscribed to me on Facebook. I haven't seen that animation in a while. Thank you for Dr. The Glide for subscribing to me on Facebook. Downs Bouncing Dinosaur. Okay. But instead, she incessantly and publicly posted inside information on social media about the trial she could have only obtained from her husband. How exciting. In clear contrast with Murphy, the circumstances at issue have substantially undermined the right to a fair trial, compromised the integrity of the judicial system, and thwarted substantial justice. Noisy Gamer also subscribes. Nice. Indeed, while defendant has not located a Florida state court decision with analogous facts, likely because the egregious and therefore uncommon nature of the misconduct at issue... If this is what you think is egregious, I don't know what to tell you, ma'am. Other courts have condemned the type of intra-family communications between jurors and their spouses or other family members that appear to have occurred in the case, even without actual prejudice. In the United States versus Gaffney, from the Middle District of Florida, for example, the district court acknowledged that extraneous influences demonstrating the existence of partiality or biases. Can the juror and his wife sue for the crap that's being slung at them? Unfortunately, no. But thank you for the super chat. No, unfortunately, they can't sue because this is judicial immunity. It's, it's litigation immunity. So they can't sue. They have no cause of action. But it's annoying. But we don't believe any of this bullshit, so it's fine. The Gaffney court noted that third party contact with the jurors once proven by defendant creates a presumption of prejudice and shifts the burn to rebut such prejudice to the opponent, acknowledging the failure to negate the presumed prejudice results in a new trial. In Gaffney, two jurors readily admitted they discussed the case regularly with the spouse, which the court observed was in direct contravention. The court's remedial mission not to discuss the case with anyone. The court concluded that discussing the case with family members creates the possibility that some jurors considered either evidence, issues, or opinions not considered by other jurors, and the discussions with family members about the case cannot be dismissed as harmless. Invoke privilege like you're, it's going out of style. That's what I say. The Gaffney court therefore determined that misconduct warranted the new, new trial. In Stouffer v. Tramamel, the Tenth Circuit, and this is Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, Federal Circuit, Conclude that even evidence of nonverbal communications between juror and non -juror, and juror spouse was war was improper, warranting an evidentiary hearing. A trial witness in Stouffer testified to observe repeated nonverbal communications between the juror and her husband, including the juror looking to her husband with a questioning look, and the husband responded by nodding and rolling his eyes. The witness explained the juror had given her husband the questioning look in response to a strong point by the prosecutor. Wow, that's deep. Someone's really, uh, really uh, trolling there. 
Although the district court concluded defense had produced nothing more than speculation, and this is speculation on top as far as I'm concerned, and denied the defendant's request to examine the juror, the 10th Circuit reversed. Knowing the timing and context of the nonverbal communications of the witnesses, specific observations strongly incur their discussing matters. Well, you don't have any of that in this case, do you? You don't have winks and nods and, you know, and, and, and hand signs. You know, you don't have baseball hand signs, any of this. This is all kind of, you, you don't have any of this. The case is not, the case is not parallel. The case is not, the case is not uh, on point. The 10th Circuit concluded that this is improper juror communication. The state court erred in failing to allow hearing, characterizing as plausible the argument that the communication did not favor either side. Yeah, Purple AJ, that's funny in chat. Notably, the 10th Circuit rejected the argument that a hearing was not necessary because the juror has stated that she had refused to talk about the case with her husband that had attempted to talk to her about the trial. The 10th Circuit considered the juror's credibility, determining the witness testimony regarding the nonverbal communications constitutes credible evidence of improper juror communication and disregard the juror's explanation. The, ju the court went on to conclude that the proper remedy was a hearing to determine the extent of prejudice, if any, concluding the trial court abused its discretion by failing to investigate the communication. Exciting. In State versus Perry, the court similarly determined that juror misconduct had occurred as a result of an expression of bias that the defendant on the part of the juror's husband requiring a new trial, even though the misconduct probably didn't alter the, require the, the new trial. Evans was presented that the juror's husband had expressed his disdain for the defendant and hope an indictment to the witness for the state, telling the witness he had talked to his wife who had already determined that he was guilty and just waiting to hear your testimony. When subsequently questioned regarding his statements, however, the juror husband said he was just running off his mouth and did not in fact talk with his wife. The juror corroborated her husband's explanation, stating her husband did not tell her, did not tell her the substance of the conversation and told her husband that she'd rather not discuss the case. Like the court in Stouffer, the Perry court properly weighed the credibility of the jury and the husband ultimately found from circumstantial evidence the juror's husband had related prejudicial information to his wife. Concluding that a prima facie showing was made and not refuted by the state, the court determined that the husband's expressed anxiety for the defendant to be convicted and his inclination to discuss the case were sufficient circumstantial evidence to support a finding of misconduct, acknowledging a misconduct the jury may be established by circumstantial evidence. I suppose a court could find this in the appropriate circumstances, but like this just not does, does not seem like the right thing. Right. There is some time somewhere where, yes, it's appropriate, but it's just not here. Right. You don't have you don't know, winks and nods and you certainly don't have any testimony from either of them. And if they're smart, neither one of them will open their mouth and they'll invoke all the privilege they can get. I would I would I'd invoke privilege for for days. I invoke all the privilege forever. If I can, I mean, I don't know the laws of Florida. Maybe you can invoke privilege in this circumstance, but if I could, I would. I'll tell you that much. Regardless of whether I talk to my wife about it or not, I don't want to talk about what I talk about with my wife. That's privileged. These decisions are instructive on the issue. They are instructive. I'm just not sure that the instructions apply here. Specifically, courts that have specifically addressed juror misconduct arising out of conversations between a juror and his or her spouse or family member regarding the case have determined that such communications are not harmless, but instead presumptively prejudicial. Here, a defendant has presented evidence, no, you really haven't, and has sworn an affidavit establishing a reasonable basis that the juror and his wife, who reside together during the court... Yeah, they probably live together. Incidentally, do you know that for a fact? Or are you just speculating? Maybe Juror One doesn't live with his wife. Do you actually know that? How do you know that? Did you go to their house? Do you observe their marital activities? Do you have someone in the bushes that makes sure that they go home every night? How do you know Juror Number One and his wife live together? How do you know that? Anyways, engaged in improper contacts and communications regarding the case of violations of the court's instructions. The juror's wife's social media posts reveal far more than a passing interest in the case. Well, many of you guys have more than a passing interest in the case, too. So I guess you're all bad people, too, somehow. 
and instead a strong bias in favor of plants and emotional investment in a verdict in their favor, similar to the jury's husband and Perry. Under the circumstances, it strains credulity to believe the juror and her husband did not discuss the case during the nine-week trial. To the contrary, the content of the social media post reveals inside information. Information she could only discover from her husband or by merely paying literal attention at all. Just paying any attention to the trial. You know, that would be great. Her heavy emotional investment in the trial and averted in plaintiff's favor is further evidence of shared bias. Bias is not the same thing as judgment on part of her husband. Juror number one, the same bias, which is not the same thing as judgment, that prompted defendant's motion to remove him as a juror before the verdict. The circumstantial evidence giving rise to a reasonable belief that juror one and his wife together formulated, ooh, they conspired, exciting, formulated a shared bias in favor of plaintiff during the trial, discussed that bias and the case, resulting in presumptive misconduct, undermining the integrity of the judicial process and warranting a new trial. So much incredibly stupid. This is so incredibly stupid. This is so incredibly thin. Defendant therefore requests a jury interview in order to establish the existence of the presumptive. You no. Know, you want you want to establish the existence. You got to establish it first. You can't go fishing. No fishing. No fee fish. No fee. No bee fish for you. Defendant therefore requests a juror interview in order to establish the existence of presumptively prejudicial communication between the juror and his wife. Although such communications will surely be denied, the court has discretion to assess the credibility under the circumstances and rely instead on evidence in totality. Moreover, assuming such communications are established, defendant further submits it will be impossible for plaintiff to prove there's no reasonable possibility jury misconduct affected the verdict. Not just because they came out with a very decisive, you see, this is the problem, like right? just because they came out with a decisive win for the plaintiff does not mean they were biased, right? It's like the reason they say it's impossible, it, and you know that because they said it earlier, the reason they say it's impossible is because, well, this jury awarded the max or close to it. And so they're obviously biased. And I'm like, that's not how this works. You can't assume bias from the result, not in and of itself. You need more, right? You need more. Just because the judge is always ruling for the plaintiff doesn't mean the judge is biased. Just because the judge is always ruling for the defendant doesn't mean the judge is biased. If the plaintiff deserves to win every argument, they deserve to win. If the defendant deserves to win every argument, they deserve to win. If Maya truly deserves $211 million, that's what she deserves. Right? So judgment is not the same thing as bias. Just because the judge is always doing one thing or just because the jury went to the wall does not mean the jury is biased in and of itself. But you're, you're assuming the bias from the conclusion. Right. You're, you're, you're saying, oh, look at how much the jury award is. They must be biased. Or maybe your case sucks balls. Maybe the scales are just really, really lopsided. Defendant submits it satisfied the standard for entitlement to a jury interview. Not even close in my humble opinion. And entitlement to a new trial be established once the jury interviews are conducted, which is not going to happen. Even a little bit. Defendant has recently learned that individuals associated with juror number one and his wife. Associated with? Oh, exciting. I wonder what associate means. Upon the belated realization that the wife, along with the juror, are participants in juror misconduct, any spoilation of evidence on the part of juror and his wife will necessarily undermine defendant's ability to prove the court with a complete record. Tim Riggs gives $10. Thank you. Is it just me or is this motion absolutely reek of desperation? The desperation is pretty thick. Also, with all these recent attempts to impugn jurors, is this new? Not really. No. But it is particularly ridiculous here. Am I seeing this multiple times in high-profile cases? I, I it's, it's come up a list. It is a, it is a little unusual. It is a little unusual, but yeah, 
It's 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 uh, yeah. Let's see. Defendant therefore requests entry of an emergency order precluding Juror 1 and his wife from deleting text messages, social media activity, and any other form of electronic data pertaining to the case pending the interview. If this interview happens, I'll be amazed. We're not anywhere close, even remotely in the ballpark of close. This is so stupid, in my humble opinion. But then again, the judge has done unusual things, so maybe I should be factoring that into the equation. This judge does seem to like push the boundaries, so maybe they'll do something strange and unusual and uncivil will have to take back his words, but I think it's dumb as shit. I'm standing by that no matter what happens. Defendant further requests limited discovery into the reference communications and electronic data. Circumstantial evidence creating an appearance of misconduct undermines the integrity of the process and warrants a new trial under Florida law as a matter of public policy. A more compelling case of jury misconduct than the 1%. <laughs> really? Really? A more compelling case of jury misconduct than the one presented by this motion can hardly be imagined? Really? Um, okay, here's some ideas from my imagination. The juror was bribed. The juror was threatened. Fine for Maya or we'll break your legs. We'll kill your family. Um, the jurors just, you know, the juror, uh, went to the crime scene and went to the hospital room personally. You can't imagine more things than this. You don't have much of an imagination, man. <laughs> Okay, a more compelling case of juror misconduct than the one presented by this motion can hardly be imagined. Counsel, you suck for imagination. The juror is in debt. Maybe he owes some money to some shady characters and is doing it to pay off his debts. <sighs> Defendants suspected juror number one of bias in favor of plaintiff before the jury began deliberation and therefore moved to disqualify juror number one to replace him with alternative. Defendant or or yeah, or they used a Ouija board in the jury room. That happened once. That'd be good. They used a Ouija board to contact the dead. <laughs> That's happened. That was a case once. That was a case once. <laughs> okay. Deferring to his client, Jack Kowalski pre predictably chose to allow juror number one to remain, acknowledging his victory with a smile to the TikTok advocate, the notorious Jules, who developed a friendship at the trial with the juror's wife. Social media posts and commentary in turn reveal not only a palpable bias and prejudice, but inside information showing... Did we write this with chat GPT? It's feeling very repetitive. It's like, we said, how many times can we say the same thing? Also, I'm unclear. Did they, did they live together? They resided together at the same household. Well, thanks for clearing that up. I was, I was wondering if they lived together. I mean, only on page 37 for the first time do you mention it. Thanks for finally getting around to it. It strains credulity to believe that they were not sharing information regarding this case, particularly given the nature of the social media participation. Defendant does not have to prove actual misconduct to be entitled to a jury interview under Florida law. Defendant only has to establish a reasonable belief that misconduct occurred to be entitled to an interview regarding potential misconduct. And once a juror misconduct is established, a new trial is warranted, unless the non-moving party can establish beyond reasonable possibility that jury misconduct did not affect the verdict. Defendant has more than satisfied his burden of proof on the entitlement to a jury interview under Florida law. Defendant therefore requests that they intervene and interview juror number one and the court's discretion, the wife. 
Let's get the wife of Bath over here while we're at it. That'll be good. Regarding the communications and contacts alleged herein in the affidavit ad accompanying this motion. Defendant further requests the entry of an emergency order requiring them to preserve messages, social media activity, and other data. Finally, defendant requests limited discovery. Wherefore, we want some bullshit. Signed, Howard Hunter, who is a clown. You are a bad lawyer, sir. This is clown fuel. You should be ashamed of yourself. You should be ashamed of yourself that you wrote this. How desperate are you clutching at straws? How very desperate are you? You're an idiot. You're an idiot and your, and your motion is dumb and lame and you should be ashamed. Okay, let's take a look at some of the exhibits. Exhibits are fun and exciting. Let's read some of this. I'm not going to read all of it. All right, so here is the affidavit from Shapiro. Apparently his name is Paul. How you doing, Paul? So I will not read more of that because I'm not sure what's in it. We took all the time to redact his name out of the things, but didn't redact the name from any of the attachments. Exciting. Let's see what else we got. Exhibit B. Oh my God. We've got pictures of the wife. They made, they made the, uh, they made the post. All right. So here she is apparently inside and outside the courtroom taking pictures. Exciting. Hold on, let me redo the margins. There we go. All right, so uh, yeah, apparently her name is at Hippo Lover. <laughs> uh, that's cool. We all love hippos. Uh, here, here's a uh, recovery addict looking sharp there, sir. Looking sharp. Here is the super chat that was referred to earlier by hippo lover super chat. Very exciting. Jules, here's a picture of Jules. <laughs> Jules made it. Jules made it a copy. Jules was sought out by influencers with large audiences because she offered commentary in the one aspect of the trial that the online viewing public could not observe the jury. Pictured here after the verdict with the Kowalski family and plaintiff's counsel. <laughs> oh, Jules. Jules, this is some, this is some absolute bullshit. This is great. I love this shit. Oh man. Here is Jules public advocate. She's holding a sign. She appears to support Maya. How very dare she? How very dare she? How very dare Jules? You're looking good, Jules. Here's a TikTok video apparently she did. And I just want to say, you know, I given her a bracelet to wear today. Before I left the house this morning, I grabbed my rosary beads. I don't know why. I knew I was giving her the bracelet to wear that was blessed by the Pope in 2017. But I grabbed my rosaries and when I saw Jack, I put them in his pocket because I knew I knew that he was going to testify this morning. After, during the break, after he's done testifying, he handed me my rosaries back. I turned around, looked at Maya, I said, Maya, do you want to put these in your pocket? And she said, yes. So when the jury question came up from the jury, he said, do you still go to church? Do you do the rosary? And she said, I have the rosary in my pocket right now. My heart just burns. Talk about divine intervention. Wow. Exciting. What am I stopping? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to cause you any distress, Jules. I'm not here to cause you any distress. I'm sorry. I didn't see your chat. I apologize. Uh, if you object, I don't want to cause you any distress. I'm sorry. Jules, they, they, they are just grasp, grasping at straws. They are just grasping at straws. And so I, I, you know, this is just absolutely messed up. But I, I apologize. I didn't want to cause you any distress. And I didn't see your chat earlier because I wasn't looking at chat. And I'm, I'm sorry. Um... I don't think you did anything wrong, by the way, as I'm sure you note, I've made clear. I don't think you did anything wrong. You're fine. You're allowed to have an opinion. You're allowed to express that opinion. You're allowed to make friends. It's all fine. Everything's good. So we have more footage of them in the courtroom. We have another one of Scott. Looking good there from Recovery Addict, Hala. Another one with Recovery Addict. I wonder if they like, comment, and subscribed on his page. Uh, I think this is the meme. Yep, this is the meme. All right, prepare yourself for memes, memeception, guys. This apparently is the meme. Uh, it, this apparently is the judge in some sort of Mad Max-like attire with channeling some sort of Judge Dredd kind of cape kind of thing with Jay Hatch labeled in the background of the image with possibly smoke emerging from it. I went and got the IJ documents myself, Judge Hunter Carroll. Judge looking very fire with his haircut, very post-apocalyptic Blade Runner. Um, very, very, very promising. So, um, yeah. Jules said show it all. I don't, and then I don't know, I don't know what was, I don't know what the problem was. I don't want to. I don't want to make anyone upset. Upset. Uh, um, so I. I, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, with the mohawk, very nice. Then why was? She, why were you telling me to stop? Then I'm confused. Why'd you tell me to stop then? I'm confused. The juror's name isn't reacted yet. Unfortunately, I kind of blew that play already. I kind of blew that play with the juror's name not being redacted. So, yeah, when I brought up the initial affidavit, I kind of blew that play. So I was kind of like, well, I already am already here. So, yeah. Uh It was a joke when I said stop. Oh, okay. I took it seriously. Okay. I try to be respectful. When a woman tells me to stop, I actually stop. Yeah. See, you know, Hey, I'm decent and stuff. Jules, public advocate, called to a live stream YouTube channel, recounting the story of telling Plano's team not to object to a jury question about the rosary. I obviously knew Jack and Maya were going to testify. Maya and I texted over the weekend. When Jack was done testifying, I looked at Maya and I said, you want to hold on to these? And she said, can I? And she put them in the pocket. You know, when the jury question was, guess what? who was objecting to the question from the jury about the rosary? They didn't want the question asked. And I tapped the court clerk with the short red hair. I tapped her on the shoulder and said, Tell them not to object to the question. 
I said, she's got rosaries in her pocket. And then you saw when the question was asked, she said, they're in my pocket. It's common knowledge. It's not like I'm revealing anything of a confidential nature. It's my little thing between me and Maya. Jules, public advocate, notorious Jules. Notorious Jules. So here's some post posted by the wife. Apparently, apparently hippo lover said hi, Rob, at some point. I'm not sure where this is. Presumably this is in Rob and Lob, Rob and Law Lumber Chat, but it doesn't specify. Apparently, Hippo Lover donated $5. You and Rob have many empathy colds, as the courtroom have colds. Yeah. Loving this. Thanks for that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Lawn Lumber can't wait for tonight. You got a fan out there, Rob. Juror number one's wife loves you. She said hi to Rob. I don't know if she's in chat and wants to super chat me. That'll be fine. Lol. She apparently said hi, Spidey. Cute. Footage of them in the courtroom observing the proceedings like a bad person, apparently. Recovery addict. Hippo lover. Donating $5 on recovery addict. I think the judge said yesterday, let them know two hours before dinner. Maybe they don't think it's for lunch. Someone should check on them. She's allowed to super chat anyone she wants. She's free. She's an independent person who can make up her own mind. Longest Florida deliberation was George Zimmerman, 16 hours. I doubt that was the longest. <laughs> Patricia says, happy Thanksgiving to you and Beefish. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. I appreciate very much everyone who donates to support the channel. It makes a huge difference. Apparently, this is the juror. I'm quite shocked at all the fuss about juror number one. I just followed the initial jury instructions, took 12 pads of notes, asked questions, to understand, inquire. Then six had an equal say in deliberation. Reviewed her notes, Evans, Binders, and bam, done. All those sent me requests, I'm not ignoring you by no means. I'm just taking a spell before I address them. Okay. I mean, you know, he's posting on November 10th. No problem there. Go back to the picture. You'll have to be a lot more specified which picture. Because I'm scrolling pretty fast, but uh, let's see. I'm on page 48. Let's see if we can figure out which page picture Jules wants me to go to. Um, yeah, it, this is this is not a good a medium for real time. Which which picture, Jules? Can you give me more of a descriptive of the picture of what you're looking for? Can you describe it? And we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait, wait, and we wait, and we wait, aid. Juror number one, MKS versus JV. <laughs> Greetings, wife and I have been watching you. Thanks for the review. You are most welcome. Thank you. I think that this motion is pretty absurd. In the courtroom? Sure. So here's... Uh, in the courtroom, so is this the one you want? Yeah. I appreciate everything, yeah. In the courtroom, we're in the courtroom. 
we're in the courtroom. That's the courtroom. So I don't know which which courtroom you want. Um, there's this one in the courtroom from October 30th. Look at the far right pick. Okay, from the other one. The far right picture. Okay. What about it? What am I looking for? Appellate courts are stodgy, stodgy about impropriety. Could an appellate judge take this seriously if he thinks meritless? Not on this record, I don't think so, no. I'm sitting next to someone else. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I didn't assume that you were going to be sitting next to her every single time. I mean, that would be a little bit absurd. But yeah, fair enough. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, you got my you got a little doxed, but we we yeah so yeah, um, yeah my my only legal advice, my only legal advice to juror number one is the same legal advice I would give to anyone, is to seek competent representation, which I can always give as ethical advice. It's one of the rules of the ethics of lawyers. It's one of the rules. It's one of the things I can always say. You should you should seek competent legal advice, and uh, and uh, inquire as to privilege because I don't know what the answer is in Florida on spousal privilege I'd inquire and uh, you know seek legal advice would be my best recommendation I won't give you any advice beyond that but do that this pick is on the defense side of court yeah I think it is on the defense side of court you're right yeah, so fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, never talk to the cops. That's always good advice. Never talk to the cops is always good advice, just in general. And it, yeah, it, never talk to the cops is very, very good advice in general. Remember, shut the fuck up Friday can be every day. Heidi Lamar says, can we go out sometimes? Sure. Send me an email. If you wanna if you're a single woman and you wanna actually go out with me, send me an email. My address is Kurt at uncivillawllc.com. It's available on my contact page. But sure. Anyways, yes. Don't talk to the police. Um, anything that's a question, you should say no. And uh, the answer to any question the police ask is can just be I don't want to talk about my day. Works great. Right. I don't want to talk about my day. It works great. Like, you're in the car and they pull you over. Where are you going? I don't want to talk about my day. Where are you coming from? I don't want to talk about my day. Have you been drinking? I don't want to talk about my day. Just, it's a great answer for all purposes. Jasmine Braid says, My own legal team was watching Rob and Recovery Addict. Jay Hatch is crying like Amber because social media wasn't on their side. Well, so they did some, they did some sketchy shit. Va Vickery White gives nine ninety nine. says, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I am single and looking, so I will not look. I will not look past the opportunity to find Mrs. Uncivil if she's out there. And maybe then I can have a wife. And maybe we'll live together in the same house. Yeah. Paul says, greeting, juror number one here. Now being the day after, I'm taking a short period to review what I as a jury was not privy to during the case. Now he's going to rewatch to see what he missed. There you go. Sharp looking guy.
the meme of the judge, which is pretty hilarious. Activity in the Facebook groups. Rob from Law and Lumber with the jury. Kristen M, your jury is famous. This is such a cool picture. That's in the court record. I like this picture very, very much. I like this very, very much. With juror one, MK versus JH. Donating $2, say agree. And it's just a picture of the jury. I'm the orange one in the top right corner, by the way. For those of you who don't know, that's me. And then let's see, because the, the one next to me is Hogue. And then, uh, forget who the rest of them are, but I think, uh, yeah. Law Talk with Mike is there with his hat. NYPD got Joe there on the bottom left. So, yeah. You'll find her, live with her, and reside with her for more than nine weeks? That sounds nice. That sounds nice. Yeah, can we get a better quality screenshot of that? Frame it and send it to Rob. That'd be great. Juror one, MK versus J hash donates five dollars to Law and Lumber saying, Dr. Joe, yes, we're like reader glasses to this jury. And then he put in many, many zeros. Which I'm pretty sure is in the is a, a number that is does not exist in the real world. You have an, a single aunt who's looking if I'm ever in Washington. If she's workable for me, I'll move to Washington. Well, strictly speaking, I'd want her to move down to me, but I'm willing to relocate somewhere in the South. Washington is not quite my climate. I prefer the South, but I'm willing to consider Florida, Tennessee, Nevada. I'll do Nevada. You really wanted my moo cow? Someone else got it, man. Runkle's here? Oh, that's nice. Can we see the bee fish? Sure, you can see bee fish. Yes, yeah, so for those of you who don't know, perhaps juror one does not know this story. Yes, this is the bee fish. It is a model of the channel because it comes out of California. This is, this is one of those wonderful legal things that shows you the law is not always what you think it will be. Juror one will like this story. All right. So California thought that bees are endangered. All right. They're concerned about colony collapse and stuff like that. Okay. And they wanted to protect bees. Now they have their own version of the Endangered Species Act on the state level, which is perfectly fine. They can do that. All right, so they have their own version of the Endangered Species Act. The state version of the Endangered Species Act does not protect bees. Okay? Now, the legislature could amend the act, but for some reason they don't want to do that. All right? They don't want to get the legislature to amend the act. So they look for another solution, and they see that fish are protected by the state's Endangered Species Act. Okay? Fish are protected. So then they sue and they get the courts, including the Court of Appeals, to say that bees are legally a kind of fish. All right. Bees are legally a kind of fish for the purposes of California's state level Endangered Species Act. Hence the bee fish. It is a bee and a fish because California says it's so. I go buzz, buzz, buzz in the ocean, buzz, 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 swimming around, buzz, 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 I'm Cali, the bee fish, Cali the bee fish. Yeah, no, so yeah, that happened, that, that happened. So that, that is the story behind the bee fish and the bee fish meme. Bees are fish. Great. Moving on. All right, that is the end of that exhibit, and let's see what else we got. Exhibit C, which is the questionnaire, which has 
all kinds of personal information on it, so I will not share that on screen. Um, but yeah, so that's the end of that stream or the end of the story. So yeah, I think this motion is really, really dumb. I think it's incredibly, incredibly, some incredibly dumb. And I, I expect that this will be denied out of hand. That is my expectation. Gifted memberships work on Apple devices now? Well, that's weird. So I just got, an, I just got a message from Lori who says that gifted memberships work on, work on Apple devices now. I've changed no settings to the best of my knowledge. So I don't know why they'd be allowed now, but apparently they're allowed, they're, they're allowed now. So that's exciting. Is it fish encompassing like crabs and mussels? Well, let me see if I can remember this. Um, it's been a while, but fish were defined to include, fish were defined in the act to include some things and then some things that were not fish. And then it said other invertebrates. So it gave a whole bunch of specific things. And then at the end of the list, it said other invertebrates. And so the California Court of Appeals said, well, hey, bees are invertebrates. Therefore, they're fish. Which is not how you do legal analysis, by the way. Because we've talked about this uh, etium generis principle, right? When you have a statute and it has the and other stuff clause, you interpret the other stuff in light of the list, right? So it doesn't mean all other things. It means other things like the things that were mentioned, right? So if you had a sign at the park that said no vehicles allowed, like car, if you had a sign at the park that said no cars, trucks, or other vehicles, other vehicles wouldn't mean all other vehicles. It would mean other vehicles like cars and trucks, right? So that's how you would interpret that. Cars, trucks are two species. Other vehicles are the other parts of the species that we're not gonna list, the other species that are like that in the same genus, if you like. Okay, so the court kind of screwed up the analysis because it's like, well, fish are a bunch of fish-like things and some other things and, and other invertebrates. But they interpreted other invertebrates to mean all other invertebrates, which is not how you do it. And then they said, well, bees are invertebrates, so therefore they're fish. That's, that was the, that was the analysis essentially. It was, it was a whole, it was a whole pile of stupid. Let me see if I can find the decision from the California Supreme Court that denied review. Because uh, it was it was entertaining when it happened. Give me one second, please. As I see if I can find this decision from a while back. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I'll just cover one article from this, like, uh, there's lots of articles about this, but here's one from Reuters. Bees are fish under the California Endangered Species Act. Bumblebees are eligible for protection as endangered or threatened fish under California law. The state appeals court held. The Sacramento-based Court of Appeals reversed a lower court ruling for seven agricultural groups who argued the Endangered Species Act protects only birds, mammals, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and plants, not insects. While fish is commonly understood to refer to aquatic species, 
The term of art approved by the legislature is not so limited. The law does not define fish, but the law is part of the California Fish and Game Code. The code definition includes any mollusk, crustacean, invertebrate, or amphibian. All those categories encompass terrestrial and aquatic species. Accordingly, a terrestrial invertebrate, like each of the four bumblebee species, may be listed as endangered or threatened species because they are fish. So that happened. That happened. So bees are fish. Bees are fish. The California Let's see. Take note of the Court of Appeals and Nine Review. Let's see if I can find this entire decision. It's not that long. I found part of it. From the from the Supreme Court of California. Okay. I think I got it. Yeah. All right, so the deci the decision from the Supreme Court of California denying review from the Court of Appeals. This is a cert denial, but I thought their language was pretty interesting in this case, so we'll discuss this. Almond Alliance of California versus the Fish and Game Commission with help from the Xerxes Society for some reason. Here's a statement from the Chief Justice of California. Here's what the Chief Justice of California said about the bees or fish. Our denial of the petition for review does not communicate any particular view regarding the merits of the issue raised in the petition. Thus, all should be understood from our decision to deny review in this case is not an endorsement nor reduction of statutory analysis undertaken by the Court of Appeal which determined that bumblebees, a non-aquatic invertebrate, are susceptible to being listed as endangered under the California's Endangered Species Act because the statute applies to fish and invertebrates are included within what the Court of Appeals determined to be the applicable definition of fish. Bees are fish. Yet, if experience is our guide, our decision not to order review will be misconstrued by some as an affirmative decision by this court that under the law, bumblebees are fish. A better, more informed observer might ask, how can the court pass on this opportunity to review the Court of Appeals interpretation of the fish and game code, which seems so contrary to common knowledge that bumblebees are not a type of fish? Doesn't this clear disconnect necessitate an important question of law warranting this court's intervention because the legislature could not have possibly intended such a result? Were, were things always this simple? Careful analysis of a statute to divine legislative intent can sometimes yield results that might seem surprising at first blush. Courts engaging in this task have interpreted less as more and unlawful as lawful. Long ago, the United States Supreme Court concluded that uh, conclude that seas referenced in one statute require no water at all. Quite recently, it determined that fish is not a tangible object. These kinds of seemingly illogical outcomes can sometimes in fact capture the legislative intent in a variety of circumstances. A statute may be construed in a manner that goes beyond the literal meaning of the text to avoid an absurd result the legislature could not possibly have contemplated. Sometimes courts receive a scrivener's error, which is just a typo, or typo that must be corrected to vindicate the intent behind a measure, or the context surrounding the use of a word or phrase within the statute can convey it carries an unusual meaning, particular to courts of law. The Court of Appeals therefore concluded below that the interpretive question before it fell to the last of these quarter categories with the consequence, with the consequence that bumblebees should indeed be regarded as fish 
under California's Endangered Species Act. So that's, yeah, bees are fish. Bees are fish. I'll go buzz, buzz, buzz in the ocean. Buzz, 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 swimming around. Buzz, 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 I'm Cali the bee fish. Cali the bee fish. So the law can be a silly, silly place sometime. We should ask juror number one if bees are fish, but they probably would come up with the wrong answer. <laughs> Juror number one, a police officer probably doesn't believe that, that bees are fish, but they're wrong, apparently, according to California Court of Appeals. How exciting. Oh, yes, we can do a bee fish swoop. Swoop. Other swoop. Other swoop is broken. Back to Maine. All right, let me read some of your super chats. Let me read some of your super chats that you've been so kindly giving me. And once again, thank you for all your donations. It does make a huge difference. Thank you very much. It really means a lot to me, it really does. Thank you. Let me go back to the top and read all the super chats that we got so far. Tony P gifted 20 gift memberships. Amy, age 51, became an uncivilian. Thank you for hitting the join button. Dog Mom became an uncivilian. Thank you for hitting the join button. Fat Yoga became an uncivilian. Thank you for hitting the join button. KL Burke gifted 20 gift memberships. Thank you very much. Fiona W gifted 20 gift memberships. Thank you. Red Rogue gifted 20 gift memberships. Thank you. Stacy Cole became an uncivilian for 99 cents. Thank you for hitting the join button. Carla Riley gifted 10 gift memberships. Thank you. Indy Cindy one gifts it $1.99 to say it took six. Rikita Law, my friend, Nick Rikita, said, love how someone attending a public trial who is married to a juror is somehow assumed to be breaching a trial confidentiality. This is obviously ridiculous. Spouses observe news about trials constantly. Show me the breach. There was none, Nick. There was none. Rikita Law gives it $20 to say, hopefully they don't kiss. Kissing is gross. Juror number one may kiss his wife. He may not. Who can say? Oh, thy Murr gives $10 to say, strictly speaking, uncivil. They are in a conspiracy, not just a criminal one. Being married may be a conspiracy, but it is sanctioned by law. Crazy Cat Queen gives $2 to say, Shapiro Esquire. Did he forget his LSAT scores? A little bit. A little bit of that energy, not going to lie. Hen House Bath Company gifted five gift memberships. Matt Bond gifted five Australian dollars. Thanks for covering this and letting Jules know she did nothing wrong. Spiffy legal mumbo jumbo talky cowboy dude. You totally rock. I will be your spiffy lumbo. I will be your spiffy legal mumbo jumbo talky cowboy dude. Anytime, my friend. Anytime. Kristen M, maker of the bots, maker of beef fish. Kristen M also made beef fish, friend. Kristen M made this for me. She is a good she is a good egg. Kristen M96 gifted five dollars to say Rob was mocked for wanting to be careful interviewing the juror. Looks like you knew what he's talking about. Now the bots are in a filing. Sure was. Bop it gave two dollars to say, see, I told you it was me. Here for the truth gave four ninety nine to say, at Gracie made a good point. Wife knew more because she was in the gallery while the jury was out. That too, that too. So she knew more than her husband did because she got to see all the things that the, they didn't get to see. Yep. And participate in community discussions and all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. So as, as it turned out, juror number one's wife was the one with inside information. She knew things that her didn't know. Kim Salvo gave $7.99 Australian dollars. Thank you for covering this, Kurt. Happy Thanksgiving to you and all. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving as well. Annabelle Feinstein gave $5. Say, as an army wife, there were many days when my hubby couldn't tell me about work. There were anecdotes like the girl who got hit with a water balloon, but zero substance. My baffled brain gave $1.99. Say, Shapiro is portending a lot. Cute. I like that. 
My baffled brain said no one like Kathy Beatty, that lady is cats in a baby in a bag crazy. I'm sure someone somewhere likes her, but yeah, your point is noted. Aurelia seven two four seven has been a member for three months. Thank you for continuing to be an uncivilian. Kristen D gave two dollars. Say pay no attention to the juror's wife behind the curtain. Charlie Lynn became an uncivilian for ninety nine cents. Thank you so much for becoming a uncivilian. I appreciate it. Elliot J N gave C A five dollars. Say regarding juror one's wife's interest in the case. He's retired law enforcement. Retired law enforcement likely have experience in court. Taking interest in support of him as she did during his career? Couldn't say. Couldn't say. I can say it's a public courtroom and she's free and she can watch anything she wants. It's almost like it's a public courtroom in the public. It's viewable by the public in a public way. The Chugi Show gave four ninety nine dollars to say this is why Rob tried to say no to interview juror number one for now. I'm worried... For Jules, who seemed like a nice lady, may have stepped over the line. I don't see anything wrong that Jules did. Jules is cool. The, the wife can talk to anyone she wants. Jules can talk to anyone he wants. Maya can talk to anyone she wants. Everyone can talk to anyone they wants. It's a free country. It's a free country. If Jules winds up testifying in this, this will be hilarious. The Zoom, the Zoom conference will be hilarious. This is all so stupid. True crime junkie, the OG, became an uncivilian for 99 cents by hitting that join button. Thank you so much for hitting the join button. Mandy Me has been a member for 14 months. Thank you for continuing to be an uncivilian. JPC gifted five gift memberships. Earbuds in the kitchen, kitchen became an uncivilian for 99 cents. Thank you for hitting the join button. C. Bumpus became an uncivilian for 99 cents. Thank you for hitting the join button. Ariel gave $5. Say objection, speculation or something. Motion for costs and sanctions for filing a frivolous motion. If wishes made it so. If wishes made it so. But my response is the judge would be basically to deny this outright. This is dumb. No. Even Victor became an uncivilian for 99 cents. Thank you for hitting the join button. Billy Motsmal said, "Could for CA two seventy nine said, could juror number one sue for defamation? Sadly, no. Litigation privilege precludes any defamation action. It's very sad." K. Rab gave four ninety nine. Say after the verdict was unannounced, they still had to hear testimony of the punitive damages and deliberate, so they were not released. Depends what they mean by verdict, and they were released, I believe, either that day or the next day. So it's all good. Casey Cat gave $10, say defense, filed another motion for a mistrial on the grounds. Judge, judge erred by allowing the IJ report in saying it was irrelevant. No, it's pretty relevant because it contradicted their own witness. I suppose, strictly speaking, it isn't relevant. I suppose, strictly speaking, it would be offered for credibility, but the judge didn't give the cautionary instruction. Eh. If the Court of Appeals reverses on that, I'll be amazed. And Dr. Goodhair never saw it because they failed to produce it under court order. Nikki Lewis gave two Canadian, two CA, to say motion to disjudgment. Heart that review document. Nikki Lewis has been a member for eight months. Thank you for continuing to be an uncivilian. BA60 joined for 99 cents. Thank you for hitting the join button. Matt Bond gave five Australian dollars to say, I somewhat remember the judge saying at the end, their service is over and they're free to speak to whomever they like, including the lawyers. They sure did say that. They sure did. Cynthia Main gifted five gift memberships. Laura Lenny gifted t 10 gift memberships. Kim Salvo gifted 7.99 Australian. Kurt, I need to know, is butt hurts a grounds to grant the motion? No, it is really not. This motion is incredibly legally dumb. A Capitan gifted five gift memberships. Dog Mom gifted five gift memberships. KC Cat gifted $5 to say when Johns Shopkins is done with this BS and the bad PR they keep inviting, will we be looking at a fire sale and name change? Can't speak to that. Probably insurance will pay for most of this. I don't know how that's going to work. Johns Hopkins may have to pay some of it in cash reserves, but they're sitting on huge cash reserves. So I think they'll be fine. Dog Mom gifted five gift memberships. Earbuds in the Kitchen gifted four ninety nine. dollars Say, did the Askin Vore Deer about Deborah Salisbury? What? Please name every person you ever met over your entire life because they might be involved. I could look at the jury questionnaire. It was quite extensive. They did ask for a lot of specific names. I'm not sure if they asked for that specific name, but they would have asked the generic question as well if you knew anyone it was involved in the case. But even still, it was the juror's wife, not the juror, so it doesn't matter. Mama Bats gifted two, two Canadian dollars or two CA to quote a slimy lawyer. They need to get a life. 
Yeah. Crazy Cat Queen gifted $5. Say motion for Kurt to move to Florida and become a J. Hatch counsel advisor so the hospital can become better. They need help. Carly Riley gifted $9.99 to give me a fox hugging a heart, which was extensively appreciated. Coral, Car, Car, Coral Saul gifted five gift memberships. Tim's Riggs gifted 10 gift memberships. Darla Shannon became an uncivilian for 99 cents by hitting that join button. Thank you very much. Jasmine Braids gifted 20 CA to say, Kurt, you simply make me happy. I wish you join the amazing things that come your way. Earbuds in the Kitchen gifted 499. How would he know to disclose pre-trial that a prior plaintiff's farm attorney he also may be crossed with, may be called as a witness? They would have asked. They would have asked him on the jury questionnaire. They would ask if you know any names, and they sometimes go on for quite a while. David Hunt gifted two dollars. Say happy Thanksgiving, Kurt. Uh, Arla seven two four seven gives five ca. Can a juror and his wife sue the crap that's being slung at them? Sadly, no. It's not based on the court documents. No, it's litigation privilege. So sadly, no. But we don't believe any of that bullshit anyway, and no one else should. And they didn't do nothing wrong. And it's all crap. So you know, yeah. Tim Riggs, give $10. Is, is it just me, or does this motion absolutely reek of desperation? It reeks pretty freaking hard. Also, with all these recent attempts to impugn jurors, is this new, or am I just seeing this multiple times in high-profile cases? It's pretty rare, but I guess in the highest-profile cases, it would be more common, so I guess there's that. $5 says denied, or Tim Riggs gives $5 to say denied. Defendant stretches the concept of reasonableness past the point of breaking into the heretofore unknown reaches of galactic incredulity. Great verbiage, very colorful. Laura Lenny gifted two seventy nine, which is apparently their third super chat ever. Thank you very much. Sharp actually told Jules to get a life in court. I remember that, told her to get a life. Look, like, if you want to watch the trial, it's open to the trial in a public way. Some people like that kind of thing. And not to put too fine a point on it, but there was a time in history when this was just what society did for entertainment because there wasn't much, right? So I, I, I always remark with a little bit of a sly smile when people talk about the modern media trials and the who law about it all. Dude, I'm not sure, I'm not sure modern media trials have anything on trials of 500 years ago because everyone in the town went to the court because there's nothing else to do and everyone in the court town gossips endlessly about the case because it's what's happening and the criers are yelling about it and all the rest of it i mean the sensationalism goes deep so you know the sensationalism goes deep so i i yeah this is yeah this is just weird KC Cat. Jules is asking, can she sue? Not for what's brought in the litigation. No, it's litigation privilege. No one can sue for what's brought inside the litigation. It's a litigation privilege. Uh, so, no. Um, you know, if there's reporting outside, you know, you know, wires pick it up or something, report on it, maybe, but. Um, not for what litigation, not for the, not for the documents themselves. Casey cat gave $5. Say Jules said, show it all. I've got nothing to hide. It's all good. Crazy cat queen gave $5. Say someone brought up an interesting thought. Seems like intimidation trying to get the public not to watch comment at 10 trials thoughts. I don't know what it is. It's desperation. It's desperation, not intimidation. I don't feel intimidated. I'm going to keep watching trials. They can go fuck off. I don't care what are they going to do. I don't fucking care. So. And they can be sad and you know that's that's their prerogative they can be sad i just wish they would waste the court's time wouldn't waste the court's time with the stupid you know let's go argue about something that legally matters this isn't it this isn't it chief you know i'm not sure if you have any issues at trial i you know i haven't been studying the trial extensively you got some possibilities on appeal you know you can maybe cut the award in half maybe you know, you might, you might be able, you actually have a pretty good shot. I think it's actually winnable for you. You know, the case loss is trending in that direction, but I don't think anyone's really there. And I'm not sure Florida wants to go there. So, you know, you have a pretty decent shot at cutting the award in half. So, you know, maybe spend some time on that. That'd be good.
<laughs> Nikki Zizbs says five dollars. Loving here. Thanks for this. Nikki Ziz said became an uncivilian for 99 cents. Thank you for hitting the join button. Patricia Beldell gave 699 to say happy Thanksgiving to you and Beefish, and then gave me a cowboy hat and orange heart. Cowboy hats and orange hearts are my preferred emojis to represent my channel. So the law, some of the law tubers created emojis that they like. So legal bites went with blue hearts and uh, I forget what other people used. Uh, Joe uses the genie as an, as a preferred emoji to represent him. And I picked the cowboy hat and orange heart orange for Clemson go tigers. So I like cowboy hats and orange hearts. So if you ever see me in a chat and you want to say hi, orange hearts and cowboy hats are, are nice. Juror one from the case, super chatting in our chat as well. Say greetings. Wife and I've been watching you. Thanks for your review. You're welcome. This is stupid. And uh, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Nevertheless, uh, the legal advice I can always give is talk to a lawyer in your own jurisdiction because maybe they will have concerns that I can't see. And you want to, you know, since there is some legal prospect out there, you know, but just as a reminder, as the judge pointed out, I'll repeat the judge's instructions. You're under no obligation to speak to anyone absent a court order about the case. So if anyone comes knocking on your door, you can tell them to piss off. If you like, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not advising you what to do. I'm just telling you to, I'm just reminding you what the judge told you. You don't, you can't be forced to do this except through court order. And I don't think it's going to come, but you know, just FYI. AG gives $5 to say appellate courts are stodgy about impropriety. Could an appellate judge take this seriously, even if you think it's meritless? Not based on this factual record, no. And if the judge dismisses it, I can't see it as grounds of appeal. I really can't. Not on this record. No. Not in my humble opinion. Crazy Cat Queen gives $2 to say thanks for covering on short notice. Happy Turkey Day. You are all welcome. Jasmine Braids give five Canadian dollars, I believe, to say my own legal team was watching Raw and Le Recovery Addict. Jay Hatch is crying like Amber because social media wasn't on their side. That certainly seems to be what's going on. Vicky White gave nine ninety nine to give me an emoji with a uh, pink haired lady saying thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. Emily D. Baker, right. Purple Hearts. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um, Kristen M, 96, maker of the bee fish. Said David, Mrs. Hogue, Hogue, you, chat, law talk with Mike, Ian, EDB, Joe, boss attorney, Bree, shop, Rob, several are missing. missing. Legal Bites took her bot from Rob and is currently holding it in an undisclosed country. But thank you very much for identifying all the bots that were on screen. Petty, honest throwaway gave 499 say thank you for being here, Kurt. You've given me thanks for giving me prep entertainment. Juror one MK versus J Hatch says this sounds very government like. B fish lol. Yep. The bees are fish, juror number one. The bees are fish, but only in California. For the moment. Patricia Braldell, gifted five gift memberships. Bug Dugger became an uncivilian by hitting the join button. Thank you for hitting the join button for 99 cents. Nikki Lewis gave two Canadian dollars. Say, see you view motion to refuse judgment being entered. Or see, I'm assuming, can you see the motion to refuse judgment being entered? I'm not sure I understand the question. I think this is going to be denied if that's helpful. BL Blazy became an uncivilian by hitting the join button for 99 cents. Thank you for hitting the join button. Aqua Mar Mar Marin gave five CHF. That is Swiss francs. Juror one commenting on B fish on your stream. Can't wait to see this coming into evidence with a party hat. Arela 7247 gave five Canadian dollars. Their second super chat ever. We need t-shirt match merch with B fish. I'll see what I can do. Juror number one. MK versus J hatch $5. If the government tells this juror it's a beef fish, then it's a beef fish. Lol. Fair enough, right? I mean, you do have to follow the court's instructions. So if they tell you that a bee is a fish, then a bee is a fish and you're going to follow the instructions. I appreciate that. I appreciate your fidelity to law. You are a good, you're a good person. 
Maria Alcinino gives 99 cents to become a non-civilian. Thank you very much. Carla O'Reilly gave 49.99. A very generous super chat today. Thank you very much. You've almost, you guys have almost collectively paid for my microphone. So uh, that's appreciated. Thank you so much. Your analysis leveled up my birthday. Thank you, Carla, for your super chat. Nikki Lewis gave five Canadian dollars. Please review their motion against judgment being entered sometime. Would love your thoughts sometime regarding the verdict form you've already reviewed. I'm sure their motion against judgment is insanely stupid. The attorneys for J. Hatch clearly still don't get it. That's very true, Beach Girl for Truth. That's very, very true. And Alan Parker gifted 20 gift memberships. Thank you very much, Alan. Yeah, so if someone sends me a copy of the motion against judgment, I'm sure it's incredibly stupid. Everything they do is stupid. The jury sat, the jury warded, the jury heard the case. And the best you can do is trim. The best you can do maybe is argue on some of the amounts. Maybe it's being a little high. Um, but I doubt you're going to get remitter here, lesser of the, the, the thing from the judge. But even there, unless you can knock out the IIED cause of action, the judge isn't going to do that, I don't think. The Court of Appeals might, but I don't think he's going to. So you're talking about you know, probably $10 million, maybe, if you're on a good day, being able to possibly get from this judge. I don't see really much more than that. The punitives are well in line with any calculation that you could come up with. So I don't see any problem there. Um, your best options are on appeal. Your best options are on appeal. The judge is trying to, the judge is trying to change the law on the intentional infliction of emotional distress for the death of Maya's mother. That is not presently legally tenable. The judge is trying to create new law right before our eyes, which, you know, someone has to, but he's trying to create new law before our eyes. It's like, you know, we, you, have a, you have a causation problem. You have a causation in fact problem. And to a lesser degree, a causation, uh, 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 to a lesser degree, a lesser degree, approximate cause problem. So, you know, go argue about actual cause in, you know for a while and you know maybe you can get that dismissed you know that would be that'd be what i'd want to do as johns hopkins lawyer i think that's a winnable cause of action and if i win i get like ha i get the award cut in half because the the largest damages were for the death of Maya's mother so if i can win that i get 100 million dollars to go away that's a pretty good day as a lawyer on appeal if i can make the damages disappear in half yeah, new laws have to be created sometime. I agree with you. New laws have to be created sometime, but I, you know, it's, it's an, I don't, I, it, it, we have never found a case. Uh, no case has ever been brought to our attention that's gone to a jury on this issue. We've never found it that's ever gone to a jury ever. So juror number one has the privilege of apparently being the first juror ever in the history of the United States to award damages in this kind of cause. So we are unable to find any precedent. And, you know, for the same reason that I kind of was mocking Johns Hopkins when they weren't able to find any precedent, it's like, well, the same thing goes the other way, right? When you don't have precedent, that's a real problem. Now, of course, in this case, it's even worse because the facts suck ass for Johns Hopkins in this action. Right, they suck ass in for oh the juror is so tainted, right? They suck ass. So the 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 facts don't lend themselves to creation of new law. The facts are arguably too extreme the other way in some respects because it's that whole idea of bad facts make or hard facts make bad law. Right? It's that whole idea of hard facts make bad law, right? Maya's mother is dead. This is not desirable. The hospital did things that, you know, if you kind of are a little bit fuzzy about the details in some sense, led to Maya's mother's death, right? So the hospital did things that, you know, little smoke led to the death. This is not desirable. So 
you know, this is, and the case already is a pretty big horror show in other ways too. So the natural tendency of people is to want to do something about it, which is certainly fair enough. But of course the, the law needs to think about issues broader than that because the law needs to think about everybody. And it raises some potential logic issues as I've sort of talked about before, right? Right. Not fuzzy at all. Well, I disagree. It does. It, it's a little fuzzy on the law because as I say, it's a little fuzzy on the law because it's legally fuzzy because you have this causation problem. That's a little fuzzy. You have a causation in fact problem and a little bit of approximate cause problem. So you have some problems in that respect. This has been up to the higher court and back. Yeah, well, now that it's real, we're going to have to have a fight about it. Perhaps a weekend stream? Maybe. We'll see. So we'll see. But, you know, who knows? Who knows? Maybe the Court of Appeals will go that way, but yeah. Maybe the Court of Appeals will go that way. I'm just, I just have my doubts because it opens up some possibilities that are a little bit uncomfortable. Florida doesn't have men mal caps. Well, as to compensation, no one does. As to punitives, I don't believe they do, no. Yeah. And the fence are disgusting for following this. Day before Thanksgiving, the next four days the court is closed. No, that's great. That's great for the other side, man. That gives them four days for free. I meant what I heard was not fuzzy. Fair enough. Yeah, it's, it's legally fuzzy because you have a causation and fact problem. Right. A does a causes B causes C. Right. You know, I shoot person, person dies. You know, the, the shot is what caused them. Right. But you have an intervening cause here. You have an intervening cause in Maya's, Maya, Maya's mother's death because self deletion is a, is an act that, um, is voluntary. And the manner of death in this particular case in particular was uh, more thought out than some alternatives. You know, she wrote a note. You know, she went to the garage and strung up a rope. You know, it wasn't just as quick as, you know, shoot, shooting yourself or something. So it requires more of a, uh, it requires a little bit more deliberation. Uh, I'm not sure that I agree with the jury. I, I'd also challenge the jury on the finding that there was the irresistible impulse for similar reasons. I, I'm not sure that that's legally tenable. So I, I would fight that and also fight the causation issue. Given bully laws, I think there's a chance. Maybe the law is moving in that direction. The problem the problem here is when you talk about bully laws, in a lot of those situations, you're talking about laws that like exist on the books. Legislatures have passed, particularly in recent years, dealing with like cyberbullying and stuff like that and taking a more harsh tone to it. But this is, to the best of my knowledge, there's no law in Florida that's making this possible. Right? The, the legislature didn't pass a law. So this is a situation where the court is trying to extend the common law. Which, you know, fair enough, because the history of common law is replete with courts just inventing causes of action. And, you know, we've, we've talked about that before. We've, a couple times on this channel, covered the very first assault case that ever happened, because it's documented, right? There was, it, the very first time anyone ever sued anyone for assault, it's, it, there's a documented case, there's a record of it still existing, and the court just invented it. They invented a cause of action called assault out of nowhere. It didn't exist, and then it did. And so, like, yeah, so it's not exactly unheard of for courts to invent causes of action, but it's not exactly common either. And it's not exactly common in the modern era, so, like, yeah. Wouldn't a guilty law be criminal, not civil? Uh, well, if it's criminal, then you're talking about guilty, but the legislature can also extend civil liability. So just because the legislature passes a law doesn't mean there's criminal liability. 
They could pass a law that require that extends civil liability. So the bull and the bully laws in some cases are civil, not always criminal. So yeah. Yeah, you can't blame the court. You can't blame the court uh, to uh, call persistics point. The court is immune for its actions in this. It's uh, so. Is it true the court said that Maya could go home with her dad if they moved out of the home? I'm not aware. I don't know the facts as well as some of you people. I don't know the facts as well as you, so I, I can't speak to that particular aspect. So anyways, you know, the Court of Appeals has to think about this beyond Maya. So the Court of Appeals has to think about this in broader issues than Maya. They have to think about this in the set of issues. They have to think about it as it would apply to all cases, right? Because this doesn't stop with Maya. If you recognize this cause of action, it's used by a, by a thousand other people in disparate situations. And not all of those are necessarily predictable. Um, so you, when the Court of Appeals is thinking about this, they have to think of about this broader than Maya. This can't be about Maya. This has to be about the set of cases that Maya would presumably be a trailblazer for, an emblematic for, but nevertheless is not limited to that. So anyways, that's a lot of legal analysis on that. And it'll be really interesting. It'll be really interesting. And you know, who knows what will happen in the end. You know, I'm, and I'm not telling you the Court of Appeals will ultimately reverse. I'm telling you the Supreme Court will reverse. I think there's about a 90% chance it winds up at the Florida Supreme Court because it's a novel course of action, and I can't think of how it doesn't. So I think there's, you know, there's there's like a 95% chance, percent chance it winds up at the, color, at the Florida Supreme Court someday. How they're going to deal with it, I don't know. You know, we have, a lot of, we have a lot of ground between now and then to cover. But it'll be very interesting to see how they go about it. And if they choose to, they choose to recognize it, it'll be very clear, it'll be very interesting to see how. Right, because it'll be very interesting to see how they do it. Because there's a lot of ways that could go about, it, and then that speaks to the broader issues. So yeah, what else do you guys want to talk about? I've got a thousand of you here, and I'm not eager to give up a captive audience. And I can keep going for a little while. What else do you guys want to talk about? I hope you're enjoying the new microphone. I got a new microphone today. Got the Shure SM7B, the same microphone that like all the podcasters use. Finally traded out, traded up from my Rode NT1A, which is also a very good microphone, but this one I think is at least 20% better and clearer and it's easier to listen to and it absorbs less room noise. It's not perfect, but it absorbs less room noise and echo. So it, it helps. Read them some of the things I've written. Like what? You mean court cases? I haven't practiced in court very much. And even when I did, it was a trial level. I've never been to appeal. Uh, our law 7247 gave five Canadian dollars, says the case you report on the baby in the UK euthanasia hospitals are stepping over the line. The color shirt and background looks good on me. Thank you. You like the new microphone? Thank you. The test streams went well. I learned a lot about audio you didn't know. Defense response to motion for sanctions. The motions for sanctions are trash. Let me take a look at this document that one of you guys emailed me. Maybe we can get started on it. Objection to proposed entry of judgment. How long is this thing? Six pages? Oh, that's short. We'll do it now. That's easy. We'll do six pages. We'll do it now. Give me a second.
Soup time is glorious time for you and me. Soup time is glorious time for you and me, baby. <laughs> All right. All right. Motion objection to motion for entry. This should be some bullshit. All right, let's read this motion for objection to entry of the proposed judgment. Thank you, LR, for becoming an uncivilian for 99 cents. It is appreciated. Defendant Johns Hopkins, All Children's Hospital, by and through undersigned attorney, object to the entry of proposed final judgment in support of the objection. Defendant shows the court that the proposed document is not even close to a proper form for a final judgment. It is primarily a recitation of the contents of most of the verdict. And just another example of plaintiff's attempt to treat the claims in the case as one big mass of allegations and damages. Mr. Kowalski is parent and next friend of Maya Kowalski. Mr. Kowalski is personal representative of the estate. And Mr. Kowalski individually have submitted one combined judgment. That's improper for a host of reasons. The portion of the proposed judgment in paragraph 18 that is only the judgment for Maya Kowalski individually ignores the jury verdict awarding him $5 million. Instead, proposes a judgment of just $1. This is the first concession of plaintiff's counsel. The jury was misled and confused by improper closing argument. The jury did not even pay attention when he asked for $1 on the claim. Instead, the jury obeyed his larger request that they arbitrarily divide the huge request for aggregate damages in an amount that far exceeds the range in which they were free to operate. I don't think so. As a result, the jury placed $5 million of the roughly $200 million requested by plaintiff counsel online for damages of this claim. Well, that's assuming a lot. That's assuming a lot. Defendants will be filing post-trial motions. Of course they will. As including motions for a renewed directed verdict and new trial for Ma Kowals Mr. Kowalski's individual claim of insurance fraud. Those motions are well taken. You can't write that. That's what the judge writes. You can't write that the motions were well taken. What does that even mean as an attorney to write the motions? Are well what does that mean? If I say that that's well taken, I'm saying that I agree with it, right? I'm saying, oh, that's a point well taken. That's a point well taken. Oh, so I agree with that. I understand that, right? You can't say those motions are well taken. First of all, they don't exist yet because you're talking about will be filing. So they don't even exist yet. And second of all, you can't say the motions are well taken. You would hope they are. You're the ones filing them. What the hell are you talking about? There's no reason to enter judgment on a $5 million at this time when those motions should be granted. Mr. Kowalski has no right to grant himself a remitterer or even ask this court for a remitterer. Why not? Remitterer just means to reduce, by the way. It's not, it just means reduce the money. That's all that means. It's where the word reduce comes from, right? Remit. He only has the right to seek an editor. That's where the word out comes from. He only has the right to seek an editor as the plaintiff who created this mess. That's the jury's verdict. Defendant will, as a last resort, if all their motions are denied, ask for a remitterer, but certainly unwilling to waive the motions preceding any request for a remitterer. So you can request a remitterer, but they can't. Why? Why can't they ask for less? That's the strangest. You're literally objecting to the plaintiff asking for less. $5 million less to be precise, incidentally. 
if you owed me money and I told you, I don't need all that money. I only need less. Would you object? But they object. They literally object to the plaintiff asking for less money. As for the claim of Maya Kowal Mr. Kowalski as the parent and next friend of Maya, that claim too involves a verdict with patent duplication and excessive awards. This will be explained in detail in post-trial motions. Oh joy, I look forward to that. Those motions will seek renewed directed verdicts on some of the claims and will seek a new trial on the alternative for all the claims. Once again, plaintiff's counsel has created a mess and the jury's award of damages by ignoring the court's warning prior to closing and making misleading arguments after the court denied defendants file motion to prohibit the argument. The motion was made after plaintiff had disclosed the huge aggregate awards it proposed to present to the jury that were discussed with the court. There's no point in entering a judgment for Maya Kowalski now. When it's clear that any judgment entered now will simply need to be substantially changed following the resolution of the motions. As a practical matter, Maya Kowalski will become an adult in 20 days. Any judgment at the time of appeal will be a judge in her own name. It makes little sense to enter judgment in the name of her parent. The order on post-trial motions can resolve that. Sure, I'll wait 20 days to enter the order if it makes you happy. Fine, I don't fucking care. As, and oh, by the way, happy birthday, Maya. How, hope you have a good one. As to Mr. Kowalski as the personal representative, the situation is similar to that of Maya Kowalski. The damages for wrongful death exceed $100 million, which is patently excessive. Uh, I don't know about that. Legally untenable, but passionately excessive. I'm not sure about that. Maya Kowalski alone was awarded 68 million. Mr. Kowalski alone was awarded 68 million. In the huge request by Plants Council using an improper method, asked for less than 27 million from Mr. Kowalski. But the jury inviting up 200 million gave him 250 percent of the amount requested. Tim Riggs says, now this one sounds like arrogance rather than desperation. Not surprised given why I solved defense counsel over the course of the trial. I tend to agree. And at this point, at this point, as the judge, I'd be completely pissed off. I'd be incredibly pissed off. You know, it's like, how many times do I have to rule in the same thing? You know, how many times do I have to rule in the same thing? It's like, I already decided these issues. I want to move on to other things. I want to move on to other things. I don't want to hear the same thing over and over again. I ruled. I ruled. Go appeal. Damn. Fuck. Incredibly, the proposed judgment in paragraph 19 asks for a judgment on the survival claim, while asking also for a judgment on the wrongful death claim. Plaintiff knows he has to elect one or the other now. Finally, judgment for punitive damages is owed exclusively by the defendant and to Maya Kowalski. Defendant following post-trial motions for renewed directed verdict and new trial, as well as motions challenging the amount of the awards. Awards of punitive damages are anchored in part by the award of compensatory. Under the law, even if appropriate, these amounts should not exceed three times the compensatory. They're not. They're not in award. They're not in excess of three times of the compensatory. They're not even close to that. This court violated the defendant's due process rights by acting a claim of specific intent that was never pleaded or raised until after the final verdict was returned. So we're going back to the fair notice in the original pleading argument. Yeah, the judge, I'm sure, is thrilled to hear that argument again. Moreover, that claim was never proven by any burden of proof during the trial. The claim should, at a minimum, award new trial and damages, but it clearly requires a correct amount of compensatory damages be established for relevant false imprisonment and battery claim. Under the improper rent argument made by Plans Counsel, jury awarded more than $37 million in compensatory damages for these intentional torts that resulted in no bodily injury. The amount is patently excessive and cannot be used as a judgment amount for either compensatory damages or as a measure for punitive damages.
Um, there's got to be a better way to go about this. I think the, I think the problem... The undersigned counsel has prepared vacation starting this Friday and returning December 4th. He needs to finish his work on the post-trial motions by Thanksgiving Day. He's hopeful the hearings can accommodate the schedule. Okay, so I guess we'll hold this on December 4th, I guess. Um, I think the problem is they're trying to have everything. And it doesn't really work. Right. The the idea that the awards are too high, I think, is possibly a tenable argument. We've sort of discussed that already in prior streams. Like, yeah, some of these awards might be a bit high. I think you might be able to make the argument. I'm not sure the judge is going to do anything about it, but you, you know, can preserve your issue at least for appeal and stuff like that. And maybe if you're lucky, you get some of it knocked down. But the problem is they're trying to have it all. And it's a whole bad apple thing, right? It just leaves a bad taste in your mouth, right? If you had made a more narrow, or if you had made a more narrow and tailored argument, maybe you could get somewhere. But the problem is, like, you're still like denying everything. You're trying to like undo the verdict. You're trying to have new trials. Trying to undo everything. It's like you're trying to unthrow. You're trying to throw. You're just like throwing so much stuff at the wall in the hopes that some of it will stick. But at least to my mind. It's like I read it and I stop caring because I'm like, all this is crap and I can't be bothered to go look for the little bit of truffle, you know? So it's like, it's just, it doesn't put me in a, it doesn't put me in a disposition to rule for you. It's like, you know, even if I were, because I'm kind of inclined to reduce the damages, but first of all, you complain that plaintiff wants to reduce the damages, which to my mind makes no sense. So you, you shouldn't allow the plaintiff to ask for less is like, what? I, I don't understand. Why, why don't you want me to ask them for less? Right? It's so, it's so batshit crazy. And then you make all these arguments and it's like, just annoying. Baby Gator gives $5 or 50, five gift memberships. Thank you very much. We're, this is going to take a while, guys. We'll be lucky to be at the we'll be lucky to be at the Supreme Court of Florida in four years. The way this is going, we're going to fight every step of the way with tooth and nail. Mile will be graduated from college by the time we're done with this. Jay Hatch is acting like a bunch of Karens. Yeah, just let's speak to another manager. You know, you gotta, you gotta sometimes think a little bit more strategically. It makes it very difficult for me to want to rule for you. And this is poorly written at that too. So I have, I have problems with this all over the place. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, I should get some rest. I'm going to get some rest. It's just that I have a thousand of you here. I have 1100 of you here. I have a lot of you here. I like, I like talking to you guys. I like being with you guys. I really appreciate that you're here. If you haven't already, if you could hit subscribe, I'd appreciate it. And just a reminder, by the way, in case you missed the announcement earlier, for those of you who have Amazon Prime and have Twitch, if you would be so kind as to please go over to my Twitch page, twitch.tv slash law, and please hit the subscribe button, which is the paid option there. But if you have Prime, you can subscribe for free. It doesn't cost you anything. And you can help support the channel. So all you people with Prime memberships out there, go to twitch.tv slash uncivil. And if you'd be so kind as to give me your Prime sub, cost you nothing. But I get paid. It's nice. My Thanksgiving plans, I'm going to go to Nate's place. Nate, the lawyer, lives in, DC, uh, lives in Houston. 
and I'm going to go travel to see him tomorrow, and I'm very excited about it. 1100 pajama party guests? You better believe it. Plus, I get to use my new toy, my microphone, which is pleasing me. I, I, I am pleased. I get, to, I get to use my new toy more. I like my new toy. It works nicely. Hello, chat. Hello, chat. How are you today? All right, chat. I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the law today. I want to talk to you about the Michael Oscar case. I hope some of you guys are really having a good day today. I have to get up before hours and put my hand in the crock pot. Lol. Nice. Have a good Thanksgiving. Enjoy your safe. Oh, you're coming to my side of Texas. Son, fantastic. I'm pretty like grow here late, but I already love Kurt's ability. Literally say exactly what I'm thinking with less legal knowledge. So I'm really it's Hunter. I have Kurt Mons and Chester with the best things in their hugs. Have a good time with names, TMR, all the fellow Americans. Have a happy Thanksgiving for everyone else. Have a nice normal day of the week. Is the SMR thing doing anything for you guys? Are you liking that? Is that is it working for any of you guys? I can do more laws. I could do Supreme Court ASMR. I could do a Supreme Court. I could do Constitution ASMR. Does my channel recognize PayPal? As a matter of fact, I do have PayPal. The bot tells you about it from time to time. And uh, I believe if you type exclamation mark donate, it will give you the thing. So type exclamation mark donate in chat. It should give you the link for the PayPal, I think. Amy Downley gives 499 says happy Turkey day from East Texas, which sounds close to non-Texans, but is not. Yeah, sure enough. Missy blue. I'll be close to you. Outstanding. That's very cool. Yeah, there it is. There's the PayPal. Zelle, PayPal, Venmo, and Stripe. Pretty much all the options except Cash App. $10 from PayPal, thank you very much. Let's see. You could do the infused drug paper story if you want to keep streaming. It's a crazy story. 77-year-old man arrested for bringing drug list paper into Howard County, Harris County Jail. Okay, that's a bad idea. Uh, pro tip, don't break drug list paper into jail. Texas attorney, he's an attorney. Even better news, accused of smuggling 150 drug lace papers into jail. Outstanding. All right, let's learn a little bit more about this guy who's getting disbarred real soon. Wrong window. Right window. Texas attorney accused of smuggling drug lace papers to inmates in county jail. Exciting. Authorities have accused the Houston attorney of work-related visits to a county jail to smuggle in legal paperwork laced with ecstasy and synthetic marijuana to inmates. Okay. A Texas attorney has been accused of turning his work-related visits to a county jail to smuggle in legal paperwork laced with ecstasy and synthetic marijuana to inmates over the past several months. Ron Lewis, 77, arrested on Friday after arriving at the Harris County Jail in Houston to visit an inmate. During the arrest, Lewis had 11 sheets of paper believed to be laced with narcotics. Lewis 
Lewis has been charged with two counts of bringing prohibited substance into a correctional facility. For the moment. He's free after posting bond tolling $15,000. An attorney for Lewis did not immediately seek return calls seeking comment on Monday. Records with the Texas State Bar show that Lewis has been a licensed attorney since 1982. His arrest came after a months-long investigation by the jail-based Criminal Investigation Security Division, a new unit earlier created to probe an increase in drug overdoses in jail. In June, following two inmate deaths that were possibly drug-related, the new unit began investigating information that illegal narcotics were being smuggled into jail in paperwork that was sprayed or dipped with a chemical compound. Creative. I mean, that's, that's creative. Stephanie 1208 gets $5 to say, so let's see now. They're trying to make up a new rule. The wife of a jerk can come into the public gallery and watch the trial in the free time. Apparently, apparently. $2 from Tim Riggs. 77-year-old smuggler, lawyer, hell of a way to retire. No doubt, right? No doubt. Investigators received tips that led them to Lewis. Authorities allege that from July until this month, Lewis visited 14 inmates at the jail and provided them with sheets of drug-laced paper, which were described, disguised as legal mail or other legal documents. Lewis was paid $250 to $500 per transaction to smuggle in the paper. During the investigation, approximately 154 sheets of paper believed to be laced with narcotics were confiscated. We're currently working with the Texas Rangers to determine if any of the narcotics introduced in the jail contributed to any death, which could lead to some homicide charges. Very exciting. Other attorneys are also suspected of smuggling drug-laced paperwork into the jail, but we don't think it's widespread. I would hope not. I would hope not. There are incredible attorneys out there to uphold their oaths and work very hard to take care of their clients and make sure they're representing them, Gonzalez said. There are always, always going to be those who choose the illegal way of doing things. If they are, it doesn't matter who they are. We're going to make sure they're held accountable. Gonzalez says the county jails, like others in the country that have seen an increase in overdeaths, the county jails had at least 18 inmate deaths this year. To restrict the flow of illegal drugs, the sheriff's office is transitioning to a new system, which will digitize inmate documents, including legal paperwork. That is uh, different, people. That is very, very different. So yeah, he he used blotter. He used basically legal documents as blotter paper, and it's like they're marked illegal. And that's a that's a that's a interesting methodology of uh, being a drug mule. He wasn't getting paid enough. That's what I think. You know, that's a real thing. How do the inmates pay? Money from the outside? I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Gangs? Money from the outside? I don't know. My Twitch name is the same as my YouTube name, Uncivil Law. And it's twitch.tv slash Uncivil Law. Um, so, yeah. Twitch.tv slash Uncivil Law. And if they can prove any of the drugs he supplied killed anybody, he's going to be facing murder charges. So that's exciting. We got six people watching over on Twitch. All right. I'll do you a little ASMR and then we'll sign off. How about that? What should I read you for ASMR? Are there any requests for ASMR? What do you guys want to hear ASMR read of? I, I'll take requests. What's your pleasure? My top five favorite songs. 
Uh, my favorite album of all time is Nirvana Unplugged in New York. Um, favorite songs? Hmm. I don't know. A Melancholy for Infinite Sadness would be another album I really like. Shakespeare, The Raven. Defense Sanctions Response. The Raven. All right, I'll do the Raven, I guess. Okay, everyone. For today's ASMR, we're going to be reading The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Once upon a midnight dreary. While I pondered weak and weary over many quaint and curious volumes of forgotten lore, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis a visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this, and never more. Ah, uh, distinctly I remember it was bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my bookcase surcase of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the ra radiant Marion, whose angel's name Lenore never lives a year forevermore. And the silken, sad, certain wrestling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic devours nevermore. So that now, to my still beating heart, I stood repeating to some visitor entreating entrance in my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance in my chamber door. Tis this, and never more. Presently, my soul grows stronger as dang then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so general came your rapping, and so faintly came your tapping, tapping at my chamber door. Then I was scarce, was sure I heard you, I heard you open wide the door, darkness there and never more. Deep into the darkness, peering long, I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only one spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and echo murmured back the word, Lenore, merely this, and nothing more. Back into my chamber, turning all the souls within me, burning soon again, I heard a tapping somewhere louder than before. Surely, said I, surely this is something at my widow lattice, let me see then what this threat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Twas the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, when many flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of saints, day of yore. Not the least obeisance made he not minute stop by her steady, but with mine of lord or lady perched upon my chamber door, perched upon a bus of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiled my fancy fan and smiling, by the grave and stirred decorum of continents it wore. Though the, thy crest be shorn and saven, thou, I said, art surely no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the early shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on night's Plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled at this unfairly foul to hear the discourse so plainly, though its answer little mainly little relevance bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing a chamber bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon sculpted bust upon the chamber door with such a name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the placid bus spoke only that one word as if his soul in one word did outpour. Nothing further did he utter, not feather did he flutter, 
until I scarcely more than muttered other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Started at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless said I, is what utters its only stock and sore. Coffering some unhappy master through unmerciful disaster, followed fast and followed faster than to his socks to one bore, till the dirges of his hope the melancholy burden bore of the never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled in a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking I bestook myself to linking, fancy upon feel fancy, thinking with this ominous bore of yore, what this grim and ghastly, ghastly gaunt and ominous bore of yore, men and croaking, nevermore. Till I sat and gassed and guessing, but no syllable expressing to the foul with fiery eyes now burned in my bosom clore. This and I more sat divining with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining and the lamp light glored. But when the velvet foes lamping with the light light gloating o'er, she shall press on nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed with an unknown censer, swung by saffron whose fought falls tinkle on the tuffled floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God has lent thee by the angels that has sent thee. Respite, respite, and netherin from my memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh, quaff this kind, never, and never forget this loss, Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still of bird or devil, whether tempter sent or tempest trot, here ashore. Desolate, yet all daunted, on this desert island enchanted, on this home by horror chanted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there a balm in Gilead, tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet, still of bird or devil, by that heaven that bends us, by that God of which we both adore, tell the soul with sorrow laden, if, within the destined Adian, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whose angel's name Lenore, Clasp a rare and rare maiden whose angel's name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word or sign of parting, bird or friend, I shriek up starting. Get thee back into thy tempest and night's plutonian shore. Leave no back plume as token of thy lie, thy so has spoken. Leave thy loneliness unbroken, quit the bust upon my door. Take thy beak from my heart and thy form from my door, quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, still filing, is sitting, still sitting, on the placid bust of palace still above my chamber bore. And the eyes have all seen of a demon that is dreaming, and lamplight over him streaming through the shadows of the floor. And my soul from the shadows lies floating on the floor, shall be lifted nevermore. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Uncivil Law. It's been a pleasure to be with you tonight. I hope all of you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. And until later, my friends, good evening. Bye.